Hey folks, how's everybody doing? Let me see. Ah, you can see me. Cool. Uh, my quality production here. As usual, welcome everybody on board. Starting a little bit earlier than schedule right now, a couple of minutes early because I feel like actually making an intro or anything like that. So let's just get to it. So what have I been up to? A lot of things. Right now, kind of messing with stuff. Not sure if I want to go away. Hmm. <laughs> Atmosphere, atmospheric humidity with altitude. What I've been messing about with, how does humidity vary with altitude? Oh, lovely. So stack exchange crap. Fuck off, stupid cookies. <laughs> kind of been... A little messing about with a bunch of stuff here. So one of the problems that I've been so trying to solve. Hey, Pilzer, how are you doing? So there's a feature inside of the Challenger, or inside of the avionics on the Challenger, which I can probably m best show you here if I go to the Cessna Skyhawk. And we'll go to some place wherever. Hey, Torbjorn. Welcome, welcome, an iron condor. Welcome aboard, sir. How are you doing? Wait. Anyway, so uh, how do I get this thing? Uh, the parking brake. Okay, cool. Anyway, finally managed to catch me live. Pilot Pro, welcome aboard. I'm also happy you caught me. Caught me live. That's always a good thing. Cool. So let's shove this in here like so. And um, pause uh, autopilot, I think. And we'll go into altitude hold, sync up heading, and go into heading hold. In fact, what I wanted to go here is, where's the altitude knob? There's the altitude knob on it. Oh, now yeah, there's two ranges. Okay, cool. Um, vertical speed, sure. Good stuff. Hey, Leading Edge. How are you doing, my man? How's the life? Over on in jolly old Australia. And CL650 pilot, welcome aboard. Cool. So, the gang's assembled. Let me just level the aircraft here at whatever. There we go, altitude select. Cool stuff. So, one of the problems that I've been sort of uh, always challenging, as usual, that's all very good. Um, Oh, we're going to be doing some more challenger in today. Any day to a stream is a good day. Oh my! Well, hopefully you're gonna ha hopefully you're gonna ha you're gonna be entertained enough not to die of boredom. Anyway, so a hey, sparker in VR. Temperature, temperature, temperature. So the challenger, or well, aircraft in general, real aircraft anyway. They have a thing, or they have an aspect of, of their how they function call well, where the altimeter reading or the, well, well, the altitude reading really, it's not the barometric like the pressure setting I'm talking about, the actual reading here on the altimeter, height above whatever. You'll notice that over here on X-Plane, if I go and change, she thinks last night you're gonna and your mind's blown. Yep. So the channel, so real aircraft, one of one of the things about uh, real altimeter, real hot start BFS expo, probably not. Um 
I can't imagine either me or Gordon making a trip to the U.S. in this kind of a situation with the world right now. Anyway, so one of the problems here with X-Plane, right? X-Plane understands, um, X-Plane understands barometric pressure adjustments. So for, you know, we go to bar, uh, barometer setting, whatever. Um, it's, it should be somewhere in weather, I think. There we go. So sea level bar barometric setting is for whatever reason it's in inches, but what well, doesn't matter. Uh, units are irrelevant here. The concept is what matters, right? So explain doesn't understand this. This is all fine. This is all good. We like this. So far, so good. One of the problems over one of the things that explain doesn't have is temperature vary or altitude variation with temperature. So what is that about? Now, all your real world pilots will know that an altimeter reading will be very, very, very dependent upon the temperature, more accurately, the temperature gradient of the atmosphere. So you'd assume if I, you know, right now I've got the temperature setting at sea level set to 15 degrees Celsius, all good. Oh yeah, oh, next year all restrictions lifted, yes, but this year, uh, unlikely. So I'm, right now I've got it set to ISA conditions, but what if I change the temperature at sea level? Notice that essentially nothing's changed, right? Explain, all, all that happened inside of Explain is, yes, my local temperature did change. I am at ISA plus 26 here, 17 degrees Celsius, but, Nothing changed on the altimeter. Stream is breaking. Um, do let me know. Maybe I maybe I screwed something up. I don't know. Let me check. Did I change anything in my settings? I didn't think I did. Four megabits CBR. Encoding via NVENC. We hardware encoder. Cool. Um, thanks for checking vote folks anyway so let's not turn who cares okay cool so here's a problem right explain does not simulate the temperature gradient of the atmosphere it changes the density altitude right well anthrax xgs yes it does um so explain does understand the ideal gas law right so it does understand that when i change um the temperature the local temperature of the air and pressure stays unchanged then the density must change necessarily the problem is that's not how the real atmosphere works um or at least that's not really approximating how a barometric altimeter works victor tango mike welcome aboard how are you so what does this have to do with anything, right? So here's the thing. On the Challenger, in the avionics, there's a feature in, uh, in the system which basically lets you compensate for altitude variation with temperature. For It's primarily meant for approaches, but that's basically what it's for, right? So you'd, you'd punch in the destination or whatever kind of a field elevation for for temperature correction and it will adjust the vertical extents of constraints on the procedure and it's basically going to change you know climb descent rate well descent gradients and some other stuff basically to make sure that even though your altimeter may be reading something different it's still going to fly through the correct um vertical position above sea level you know absolute altitude so to speak but instead of explains atmosphere right now, there's no point. You could change, you could have a massively different temperature. It would make no difference. So why is this? Why, why does, I mean, laminar are no fools. They, under, they understand simulators reasonably well anyway. Um, so, or like in Boeing, but it act like on Boeing's and Airbus, but it actually works. Um, I suppose so. Or Bjorn, maybe. So what's, how do we do that, right? So I have to write my own atmospheric simulation for that. 
So I, I've done essentially just that. Well, for the time being, it's very, very, very simple. Let's go ahead and quit the simulator here. I'm going to reload at a different location. Just going to quickly toss the airplane into the air. Hope you can see my screen sort at least. Oh, well, you can see something. Where the hell did I load up? I think I might have loaded up at the wrong place. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. Uh, here we go. About to, I don't know. Okay, we, we, didn't, we didn't teleport. Cool. Um, so let's just do a quick start of the aircraft. Eh, eh, or whatever. Get some light. Lights going doesn't make a difference to me. And we, we, we're on stream, so let's go ahead. And I've got no music playing, so let's go and just play sim audio here got that going rock and roll just a little bit of time acceleration here for extra goodness and gear nose wheel steering gens brakes on that goes away that goes in that goes away like so. Perfect stuff. It's just minimizing the amount of warnings and annoying sounds I'm gonna get. So let's go to 12.5 as before. Go to 250 knots because the Challenger likes to fly just a smidge faster than a Cessna. Realign the IRSs here quickly and let's go and just put the airplane into a sort of a heading hold here, close enough anyway. Uh, let's see what I want to do here. I'll roll up the speed here. Go to the an autom automatic speed hold. You got to put in a climb speed thrust limit. Engage the auto throttle. And go to like 250. And close enough. 12.5 is I think what we set here. Climb up. Good. Is it not too loud? I hope. Uh, it's it's back. It's almost completely silent. How's it so quiet? Uh, might be because. Oh, there we go. Give you control. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. Weird. I don't know why it's so quiet in the in the recording here. Hopefully you can hear me. Kind of the important part. Anyway, um, so I've implemented my own little custom atmospheric doodad, and and the way it works, you'll notice here. Very loud and clear. Lovely stuff. Thank you. So what does it say for temperature? Right now we are pretty much at ISA conditions. In fact, we might be exactly at ISA. I'm going to check here. The temperature sea level. Ah, there we go. Almost prefer perfectly ISA conditions. Good stuff. Now, notice what happens here when I change the temperature like plus 50. Now I've got it I've got it set up in such a way that it gradually adjusts internally so it's not like a giant jump right away but you'll notice that we had quite the change in altitude and it's still not done by the way notice that we're barely barometrically it says we're almost level but we're like two degrees no track up right so we're still climbing in ab absolute terms you can see that over here on the left still climbing still climbing and it's going to take a couple of, well, maybe about four or five minutes. I've set it up in such a way that there are not, you know, giant jumps in the, the way that the simulation works. 
Now there's a slight concern in that if everybody else, if you're flying on a network and everybody else is flying at the wrong altitude because they're not actually taking into account the fact. So the, this is called isobaric compression and expansion um, or compression or expansion of the isobars. Isobar expansion or expansion and compression. Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of different, there's not too many aviation charts for this and on Google or on, on images, but whatever. Anyway, we're pretty much level here, but you'll see that we're at 13.5, so we're a thousand feet higher than the altimeter is indicating. That's because I've basically set the temperature high. In other words, the temperature compensation function inside of the avionics, in order to fly a procedure, you'd actually have to go fly at a lower altitude. Now we gotta follow YD simulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's say I was trying to fly at, I don't know, 15 or 12.5 thereabouts. I'd actually have to go and descend down to about 11.4, and then we would actually be at 12.5. Um, cool stuff. Cancel the alert here. So this is sort of just a very, very rudimentary simulation. Now, here's the problem. I mean, there are some problems with, I understand why uh, the guys at Laminar did it the way they did. It's, it's not an entirely dumb decision on their part. They actually did it reasonably for practicality reasons. Uh, one of the problems is, do you ever wonder, uh, actually we need to be even a hundred feet lower than this. Yeah, so we need to be about 11.3 to be actually at 12.5 MSL geometric altitude, the correct altitude, so to speak. If we go and have a look at what the GPSs are reporting, <laughs> they're going to be mightily confused. Oh. 12.5. Uh, I think these guys need to be fixed. Or do they? No, hang on. No, these, these are right. Okay, 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 cool. Whew. I was about to stress out. Okay, cool. So this is geometric GNSS barometric altitude and then some height having to do with ellipsoid shapes and all that kind of good stuff. We're, we'll get to that later. But, so now we're about 12.5, whatever, something close enough anyway. You'd actually, the avionics is actually able to get you down to a, an exact foot number uh, for a constraint or anything. So would be fine. Anyway, so this is what I'm talking about when it comes to barometric uh, altitude correction with respect to temperature. Now, here's the thing. Right now, this kind of a parameter strongly, or, or the, the this kind of a gradient of the atmosphere very strongly depends on a bunch of stuff. So the assumptions that I've made in my code so far, and this can change, we can, we can mess about with this, um, is that we have essentially a kind of constant temperature lapse rate, right? So the temperature gradient is the thing that essentially drives this parameter. It's this guy here. I'm sort of assuming at this point that that number is essentially the standard atmospheric temperature lapse rate. The problem is that is not always the case. Um, when you're, when there's a very, when there's a very high amount of, I'm used to it being the other way, cold weather corrections. Well, yeah, Canada. <laughs> Canada is the other way around, yes. And there you'd actually have to fly higher in order to be at the correct altitude, which is one of the reasons why there is that saying, high to low, look out below. Because when you're going from high temperature to low temperature, or from high pressure to low pressure, you're actually descending. <laughs> but X-Plane does give you the, the pressure part. It doesn't give you the temperature part anyway. Well, let's talk about this. So here's a problem, or here's one of the problems. And Arpalakis, thanks for the follow. Welcome aboard. So here's the problem, right? So the temperature elapse rate in the atmosphere is based upon a parameter or is essentially based on the relative humidity or the amount of moisture 
in the atmosphere because the way in which the temperature of air drops when you go up it's called the adiabatic expansion or adiabatic cooling process if you're a real world pilot you will have learned about it all about in this in your meteorology class but I know a lot of people forget about it so let's just do a quick recap um, as air expands essentially the energy inside of it becomes more dilute right so energy is conserved if you expand the volume, which contains a certain amount of potential energy, which is essentially temperature and pressure, what, what they are from a thermodynamic standpoint, they're kind of potential energy. You expand the volume, you essentially lower the density of the energy, which means the individual energy of the molecules goes down, therefore temperature goes down, essentially. And so here's a problem. If you go and expand a volume of gas, um, not all the energy um, just simply goes into motion of the molecules, which is, temp which is temperature. There's a thing also called latent heat of vaporization, which basically means that the, uh, the, uh, the gas, well, the water vapor, so there's teeny tiny droplets of water vapor inside of the, just kind of a packet of air. As it expands, uh, the water vapor can start to change phase, essentially go from being a gas into a liquid and so on and so forth. But this process releases energy, which practically manifests as if the temperature lapse rate of that gas, as you expand it, because, you know, as it essentially goes up, its pressure goes down, um, that has the effect of giving you a shallower loss, shallower gradient losing temperature, right? So temperature does not go quite as quickly down when the air is very, very humid. On the other hand, if you have a completely dry packet of air, no water vapor in it at all, your temperature lapse rate is gonna be actually fairly high. It's about three degrees per thousand feet. It's about half that with fully saturated uh, water vapor or fully, yeah, fully saturated uh, packet of air with water vapor. So what do we use for that? So in X-Plane, we unfortunately do not get uh, a humidity value for every piece of the atmosphere. X-Plane's notion of the atmosphere is just very, very, let's call it simple. Um, that'd be a very generous term. Um, X-Plane's model for the atmosphere is very, very straightforward and simple which is to say they don't really give us too much to work off of. So what do we use for the temperature lapse rate? Do we use standard pressures as a standard lapse rate, or do we actually go and uh, change it over time? Like we could do a piecewise integration over the atmosphere, sort of the height column of the air, and that would give us a differing uh, lapse rate with altitude. I'm not really convinced that that's all that necessary. The temperature lapse rate is, uh, it does change, but you'd have to be in like absolutely insane thunderstorms or I don't know, the Atacama desert to like see a significant change of the lapse rate. So I'm thinking the TLR, the temperature lapse rate, we'll just leave alone. We'll leave it at the ISO standard value. Um, we can mess about with it a little bit, Maybe later on, I'll see about that. Another thing that I've been thinking, which I'm not currently correcting for, is here's where we actually pull data out of X-Plane into the simulation here. It's basically, this, this is what drives all the sensors inside of the aircraft. Um, so basically, I didn't even have to recode the altimeters here. The altimeters are already simulated as air data computers. They read the pressure, the simulated pressure out of the sensor systems, right? So we simulate each of the individu individual pitot tubes here or individual probes. We measure its, its angle of attack with respect to the air. Same thing for the static ports. Um, we measure or we simulate essentially kind of RAM effects. That's all simulated. So the air data computers internally, they just take that pressure use the standard temperature and pressure computa computational math and just give you these readouts. So that's where these numbers are being synthesized. But right now what I'm using for feeding these sensors, so what 
gets fed into the avionics simulation of the aircraft is um, for, it used to be, literally, it used to be, before yesterday, uh, it used to be, I just read the pr static pressure and static temperature of the air around the aircraft, just got them out of some data wraps inside of X-Plane and just fed those into the avionics. But that doesn't give me the proper, um, the proper static pressure because of the fact that it doesn't actually simulate um, temperature, ch the change, the gradient for, for the pressure loss rate. And it also unfortunately does not give me correct temperature evolution. So one of the things that I've kind of been really annoyed by X-Plane, inside of X-Plane, is the fact that X-Plane really likes to, mm, let's be generous and call it, screw up the um, vertical gradient for temperature. So right now, the way that the atmospheric pressure, the, the vertical column simulation right now works for pressure simulation, is it essentially assumes that the TLR, the temperature lapse rate, is essentially constant all the way to the tropopause. After that, it's basically flat. That's essentially ISA. But x does not do that for static temperature itself for the air, which is important for things essentially like the temperature indications here on the displays. So if you've ever wondered why in x you can't actually get an ISA deviation that's any meaningful value at high altitude, that's why. Uh, so an explain. So an explain. Unfortunately, the temperature or pressure. I'm sorry. The temperature gradient does not follow ISO standard conditions. Rather. For whatever reason, x basically just washes out the ISA variation with altitude. I don't know why they do it, but they do. So notice that, for instance, right now, I've got the temperature at sea level set to 50 C, right? I've got a completely heat, superheated atmosphere down there, which would imply ISA deviation plus 35. Well, I'm reading ISA plus 24 here at, you know, 12,000 feet or whatever. Huh. I didn't account for time passage when paused, so that's going to have to be a thing. Cool. So let's go. Oh, no, hang on. Yeah. Just messed with the knob here. That's the problem. Okay, that was all cool. So, say for instance, we go and initiate a climb. I think I've got payload on, don't I? I don't know, I don't. Cool. Let's go ahead and initiate a climb. And as we climb, you'll notice the ice deviation starts going down, which is kind of dumb that's really not the way it's supposed to work and even worse in fact i might be able to show do we have oh, i said dev uh, temperature outside temperature ambient there we go uh, we have a variation value for ISA here in the data refs? Uh, probably don't. Anyway, you'll just have to trust me then that this computation is correct. And anyway, I mean, I can sort of mess around with it. Go inside of the simulator here. So you'll notice as we come up in higher and higher altitudes, the ISA variation goes down or like it, and it's not like it's going down forever. It's just going down to zero. It just approaches zero. And if we go sufficiently high up, just toss the airplane up at, at like, what was my pre-select 35,000 feet. So I'm just going to put it up to like 34. Airplane's a little bit unhappy here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I kind of pissed it off. <laughs> ATS, please. Yes. And... No, not that. I want to go to there. Slight little change. And please give me some speed. Some forward speed. The airplane should try and avoid a sink. But can't get there. Can we actually get enough? Uh, poor thing is out of trim like crazy. So it's trimming as hard as it can. But... With the flaps not running, the autopilot is just stuck with trying to slowly trim. But we'll get there eventually. Hopefully. We're kind of close to a stall. <laughs> We're hitting the engine N2 corrected speed limiter. You'll notice that the engines here are as max power but we're still only pulling about 84 percent and won't even though the climb thrust limiter is at 96.3 so why why is why are the engines not accelerating it's because of a feature of the fuel control unit uh, the fuel control unit when the engines at very very um very low temperature in on the inlet here minus 42 degrees celsius ram temperature then it will hit a thing inside of the fuel control unit called the corrected speed speed limiter which prevents the core rotor from rotating too fast at very low inlet temperatures you can talk us through how to plan for this normally we put in most values in the fmc and let x plane do its thing are there any manual calculations so it's not something that you have to manually calculate fortunately you don't um on the yeah, the avionics basically takes care of most of it for you. Whew, fortunately, we're able to accelerate out of this. Slowly getting up there. And as you see, as we accelerate... So fortunately, we're actually going to be probably working today on the temperature compensation feature. Let me bring up if I have uh, a manual for it. I can show... There we go. Temperature compensation operation. There we go. Uh, yeah, this will do. So. There. So the avionics does have a feature in it that lets you automatically adjust your approach altitudes. So you basically punch in the... Um, temperature at the field and it automatically adjusts the relevant altitude limits higher or lower such that they will essentially again be in sync so the airplane is capable of supporting you on that so you don't have to you know do too much manual math but there's a complication with this so a slight one anyway there we go, slowly pulling our souls out of this. Good stuff. There's a slight complication on that front, or, well, I mean, the math in itself is, is slightly complicated. Um, I know why Lamar didn't do this um, for their reasons. Um, it's a thing that, in general, Unless you have some tight control over the aircraft itself, it's a little bit difficult to implement correctly. Here's why. Uh, let's go to this guy here. Cancel. No. no. Yeah. Cool. So here's a little set of charts, whatever. That. Or rather, you know what? I'm going to bring up a little tablet here it's probably going to be better if you're going to be able to see so so you can see what i'm doing and by just one sec as soon as i find it found it thanks this go, goes this way around cool what's this Okay. All right. Cool. 
And the airplane's slowly climbing up. Anyway. Always put in details in the, on the arrival airport, but never quite understood the exact science behind it. Uh, I'm not sure if Boeing or Airbus do this quite to the same degree. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, uh, the the way that the Collins system does it is they also adjust. We go to where's a picture of the friggin' thing. Yeah, there we go. Um, so. What the Collins system does is it also adjusts, you'll see over here, um, it actually changes the approach altitudes on the approach procedures themselves. If I go and roll it up here, you'll notice that it changes the altitude constraints associated with the procedure. So that's how the thing does it. Um, whether Airbus does it the same way, I'm not entirely sure, or, or Boeing. Maybe they do. I mean, it would stand her reason. So what is our problem here? Huh. Hang on. Why is my change computation system here stuck? Ugh, I think I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm an idiot. Uh, right. <laughs> Uh, what does it say? Well, at least it thinks that we're still fine. I didn't tell. How are you, man? Righty. Feet to meters, blah, blah, blah. Temperature lapse rate, blah, blah, blah. Drop a pause. There we go. So this kind of integration is not correct. This is wrong. Go ahead and label it. I think it's unused for the time being. And as soon as I reload this, it's going to be a fairly unhappy sim because it's going to be very high. It's on a plate today. Altimetry. Didn't you read the description or go in live notification? I mean, you might have. Okay, now it's unhappy as fuck. Get the INS is realigned. Good stuff. Like at a clack. Awesome. And I want you to roll it up to like Mach 0.72 is good enough. Cool. And power's coming up. Good stuff. Let's just stay here at 50,000 feet or whatever. So you'll see, the X-Plane's reduced our ISO deviation back down to minus two. And it's actually gonna go down to zero by the time we hit the tropopause, which is by default 36,000 feet, 36 something, 11,000 meters. Hmm. So, oh. Put our little thinking caps here. I'm pretty sure that, well, I mean, it's, um, I'm not really sure. So we're reading right now 39,300 geometric altitude, 35,000 barrel altitude. So they're about 4.2,000, 4 4.3,000. Oh uh, yeah, sure, face cam, there you go. I turned it off because it was sort of booming about here. Anyway, um, atmospheric temperature gradient. Oh, 
what exactly is the task here. I guess it's harder than, yeah, it's a little bit harder than that, yeah. Yeah, so the temperature gradient, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Palomet per meter, sure. So the, let's have a look. International, okay, so. The international standard atmosphere basically assumes a sort of, you know, whatever, kind of standard deal for temperature, especially down here, where the, the part really that we're interested in basically assumes a constant temperature lapse rate. Um, is that correct? Probably not. Uh, uh, mesosphere. Uh, somebody does jump even higher than Baumgartner. Uh, whatever. I guess when you when you're in the business of one upping each other. I've been flying airplanes for the better part of some. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know Perlani. Red not VS. Yeah, so one of the things that's kind of confounding me here, like, is this a believable number? Um, is this a believable number at 39,300 <clears throat> for the geometric altitude? Um, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. GPS unit is correct in that. It says 39,300 for us. But that's simply, I mean, the real mind bender for those that I want to know is what the difference between GNSS height and GNSS altitude. Photoism. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> non-standard day conditions AO standard atmosphere 56.5 yeah sure whatever but but that the thing that the ellipsoid isn't equal geoid yes yes that is that is it amazed that you know We're in wasp coverage area. But yeah, hmm. That's the thing is, is do we believe that number? Now for simulator flight, for, for I'm sorry, for online flight, this is gonna be kind of an interesting thing. I might have to actually make this a toggle where you're able to disable this function because if you're flying all of a sudden 4,000 feet higher than everybody else who cares that you're actually correct if everybody else is wrong in the same direction um i don't know we'll see so one of the things that's kind of been confounding me here is do i just keep the temperature or, or yeah temperature lapse rate for constant or do i change it over time or over altitude red not vs thanks for follow do i change it with altitude i could No, it's got to be more to it. So I, I messed up something. ELR times height. Ah, oh, right. Hang on. Oh. This would assume essentially uh, a. Yeah, no, hang on, I've screwed something up. 
we are at the station here. So this is basically the equation I've been looking at. So your temperature lapse rate, but it would start decreasing as soon as you hit the tropopause. And here's the barometric equation. It's a different version of it. And we could do that. Let's check this one. I'm sort of in the, I'm sorry, you, you can't, uh, wrong button here. Ref reference pressure, PA, reference temperature, Kelvin. All right, so let's go ahead and implement this one. I'm sort of really messing about the stream, so do bear with me. We're just going to be messing about here momentarily. Experience 9 months. CCS world formation plan with TBM that flows most the most enjoyable. Oh, cool. Glad you're having fun with it. I'm not really a DCS guy myself, but I know people are having a lot of fun with that one. Cool stuff. Let's move you out of the way here. Let's have a think. Reference temperature, temperature lapse rate, kilometers per meter, ice, LB height times reference height here. Yes, height of reference level B. 11 kilometers. Reference function of height above the sea level. And divide by TB, which is your reference temperature. Oh, let's have a fun, let's have a little bit of fun. So I'm going to show you exactly how this kind of trickery works or the way. So here's the problem. Um, or here's the reason why x -Plane doesn't do this natively. It's because x -Plane doesn't have data for the vertical extent or vertical shape of the atmosphere in terms of um, how close together pressure lines are. So the reason being is that these things or this parameter is not a reflective reality did i miss the ADM, a diabetic rate lapse rate excitement sort of just a little bit not too much um so here's the reason why explain doesn't do uh pressure or temperature changes w for the doesn't simulate altimeter altimeter reading changes with temperature it's because of the fact that if we graph you know, this is your standard um, equation for height versus pressure and then convert it back into an altimeter reading you'll notice that these are right now if i graph them out they, they are in perfect agreement that that is because i'm essentially this equation here i'm using standard conditions now if i change or yeah essentially uh, let's go with that if I change the local temperature, if I go to, this is ISO conditions, let's go to 15 degrees hotter. You'll see that the red line here, that is your, um, your altimeter reading. Blue line is your true altitude. Um, you'd be under reading. So you basically, uh, if you're red, the true altitude, you'd be actually be higher. But, and the more important part is you'll notice that the slope changes. So let's make it really extreme so you can easily see it on the slope. the your barometric altimeter inside of the aircraft assumes the blue line essentially it is well more importantly it assumes the blue slope the slope of that line to generate um your alter your altitude reading right so it basically looks at the pressure here which is non-linear it's it's not graphed here but i can actually probably graph it uh, go to well let's just generate a new chart for it for insert chart just a simple line please and looking good okay you'll notice that the chart is not a linear quantity so the problem there is that the slope of this quant of this uh, the, the slope of this is very very dependent upon temperature so if i move this over one over and I'm going to construct a second set of parameters here. Let's just call these 
Yeah, pressure. I'll, I'll, I'll you press ISA and we'll go you press at temperature T. Oh, come on. Cool. So, and you actually need to be looking at A5. Cool stuff. But, this is right now looking at T0 to see that. Okay, so I'll go and create a new column here. And this is instead going to look at D2. No, C3. Yes, that's the one. So now, I've got two, hopefully, uh, data ranges. And you want to graph out to C60. So you'll notice that at this point, we've got, even though the, they are graphing the, from the same base value here, starting at ISA pressure at sea level, um, we are graphing two different slopes. So the blue line here would be at a, well, let's, let's make it like this, 28815, that would be the standard conditions. And let's make this 28815 plus 50 degrees. So the yellow line here, or the orange line now, is your um is your pressure with altitude basically the x-axis here is altitude you'll notice that it, the pressure drops less with altitude that's because it's simply hotter the air at ground level is hotter and the entire column of air is hotter so how do they actually but your your altimeter assumes the blue line here right so it assumes that kind of a slope of the line so how do they actually get your altimeter to read field elevation at something that isn't at sea level. Let's say you're high up at two kilometers, right above sea level, 6,000 feet, and you want your altimeter to read whatever is necessary to be to show there. They basically adjust this base value here in a, in a kind of a fake way. They adjust it even though seemingly at sea level, I don't know what the hell did I do here? Uh, Get rid of these two numbers. We'll just. Oh, right, I know. Uh huh. Rid of you. Cool. All right, actually, this is the number that I've been looking for. And I want you to read. Uh, it's supposed to be. Yeah, okay, cool. So it's still fine. So these are sort of the altitude readings that your altimeter would be shown on. Let's make all of this in round numbers because it just absolutely cannot be asked to mess with leading zeros, decimal places, nothing. Cool, looking a lot better. Uh, what the fuck did I do? Oh, that. Yeah, whatever. Um, so you'll notice that right now they are in sort of agreement, right? They're just a couple meters apart. This and this, this is your, this is our input altitude. This is the al what the altimeter reads at the other end, what you're going to be seeing in the cockpit. But if I change the temperature of the air, so instead of looking at this pressure, what if the altimeter was reading this kind of a pressure? So you'll end up with something inside of the cockpit that looks very unlike the actual field elevation. Let's say our field here is at 2000 meters, your altimeter would read 1704, even though the sea level pressure is correct, 1013, the problem is essentially the temperature gradient. So what they do in reality, and um, when you get the QNH value, now that's the problem is QNH is not the sea level pressure. A lot of people think that it is, but it isn't. Uh, QNH, is actually an adjusted uh, is an adjusted value that is often so good. Q is not C level. Make your ISO calendar exactly right. So it's just there set up in such a way such that the uh, such that these curves intersect at the field elevation. So let's say one zero two five would be I don't know whatever something. Does I actually make it read correctly here? It should be reading off of there. All right, hang on. Uh, ah, here we go. 
So this guy now, I've basically shifted that line up. So even though I have previously one zero one three two five, these lines, let's make it really extreme, one zero eight zero. You'll notice that these lines now intersect at a different point, and that's what the QNH value is designed to do. It's basically designed to trick the altimeter into making it behave as if you are there. But the problem is, this means you need some sort of a reference or to uncorrect it or basically figure out the vertical gradient of the atmosphere or to basically work back. I have to know what they, and the problem is explain only gives me the QNH value for the level barometer or whatever brown or something um in order to figure out what they used for that q and h value unfortunately there it, it's sort of muddled up in, muddled up inside of that value it, it's both the temperature and the reference sea level pressure gets bound together and i have to disentangle them somehow in order to do that i need to know what they were aiming for with the when they were calculating that sort of fake q and h value so how do we do that? We do that by trickery, essentially. Um, I'm doing it by basically looking at what you have entered in your flight plan. That's what it said. That's that's why I'm what I meant when I said that X plane cannot do this in general for general aircraft because it doesn't know if you're flying to somewhere else. Right? So I do it basically at this point by looking at your origin, destination, and alternate measuring your distance from them and if you get to within a certain distance of them we'll slowly 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 start adjusting our reference base point for the q and h setting to then work back what the atmospheric gradient is like and that's what you're seeing over here running in the background slowly running in the background it's it's basically just slowly adjusting its reference elevation value to well right now it's going to the ground level but if I go ahead and punch in in the nearest airport, hopefully I'm close enough. I'm probably not. Am I not close enough? How far away am I? Uh, let's go, no, not that. I wanna go like that. I'm 124 miles away. But I keep driving at it. I've basically got it designed in such a way that right now it's looking for atmospheric mean. It's looking for being within 80 miles of the destination. It basically has a number of possible scenarios. So what if you're, you're if you're less than 40 miles from the origin airport, it's going to lock into the origin airport and try and adjust its base reference elevation for the atmospheric corrections to the origin airport. Otherwise, it's going to go for the destination if that is within 80 miles. Otherwise, it's going to try and the, do the alternate if you're within 40 miles of the alternate. And if all else fails, it actually looks for the nearest airport, which I still got to implement. And if even there is no nearest airport within 40 miles, then it's going to go for whatever the ground elevation here is at your current location. But it goes very slowly adjusting that value so that you don't get a like sudden jump in 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 altimeter reading and there's a bunch of other scenarios here as well when, when your origin and destination are very very close together like less than 40 miles apart and it basically does a blend of the two slowly blends in between them for the reference elevations and these time scales here for how quickly it filters the the values what the hell did i make these lowercase well, apparently i did Okay, these need to be actually uppercase uh, ref elevation filter rate and go for case sensitive match Ref elevation Filter rate like that cool So it basically filters that in very very slowly. So the normal filtering rate is 400 seconds So over the span of 400 seconds, it's gonna get to within about two-thirds of the target value done with another 400 seconds another two thirds of that remaining piece. And it basically just gives a very, very gradual change in that, um, in that pressure value. So if I time accelerate here, I'm gonna try and tilt the view up a little bit so that we can get faster time acceleration going. Just as the time on top of descent, we're not actually gonna descend, so go away, explain. 
I didn't want to do this. I want to do this. Cool. Good stuff. And as we get to within, hopefully, at some point, within 100, within 80 miles, it should start to gradually adjust the reference elevation target to the field elevation. Now, in this case, it's essentially a sea level airport, right? So it's about 150 feet up off the sea level floor. So it's or off sea level. So it's not really going to make that much of a difference. But if the field elevation was something much, much, much higher, you know, several thousand feet, this can actually change your your measure the gradient of the atmosphere quite drastically. I'm on an airplane. Get there. Would have helped if I accelerated, but I'm too lazy. Now let's go faster. Got him off 0.78. Not really like it's gonna make much of a difference anymore. Cool. So eighty point seven. There we go. So now we're it's using the destination as a reference field. And it's slowly adjusting to 226 feet, which is the database entry for the field elevation above sea level for the reference point anyway. You'll see that it goes very slowly. If this was a higher number, then it would obviously be adjusting much faster. Um, but it's designed to basically avoid giving you like crazy changes in uh, vert vertical profiles and everything. Still, this does not change that I haven't uh, Temperature sea level. Okay, 50. Let's just go ahead and dive bomber on in there. Do we have some sort of an approach there, an, an arrival of some sort? And there's approaches there, but I don't know if, the, if any of the arrivals here is going to work. Uh, how about you? No, not you. Not even. I'm basically coming up from a different from a direction, which is not really kind of good for this. Uh, uh, RNAV, uh, one zero, Uber? Sure, direct to there. Awesome. Rock and roll. And we're way high. 10,000 feet high. Well, down we go, I guess. Speed brakes full. Go to like super duper top speed for the descent and dive bomber on in there. That goes to Pancake King. Vinny going well, reasonably well anyway. Let's see here. Is this ever going to happen at this kind of a descent rate? At this rate, yeah. But we're probably not going to be able to maintain that rate for the sun anyway. Yeah, it's going to have to level off here slightly. Oh, never mind. We'll just do some S turns. Yeah, I'm way too close. Way, way, way too close. No, it might. I stand corrected. It might. Got an oscillation here going. FCC steering configuration. There's an L aileron parameter. Or do 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 ailerons. These guys need some more. Let's have a look. If I change the derivative rate. And shorten up the time span here. Out of funsies. What if I go to the other way? Oh, 
that's made it worse. Made it much worse. Will you not do proper ISA deviation in the crew? May not have proper. Well, we'll see. Reflector reality sim. I haven't decided on that yet. We might. I need to find good data on that, really. Kind of going to be the holy grail. Okay, so it's dampening out like this. really not rate related it's more more like oh it sort of is rate related <laughs> well the good news is we actually might be able to make our descent target here engage vnav got a full speed descent rock and roll down we go baby gonna reset these back Good stuff. How are we looking on the vertical deviation? Coming in fast. Alrighty, we might be able to make it. Thousand feet, there we go. Vertical path. So pull speed back. And now we're going to slam on the brakes. It'll be absolutely unbearably loud inside of the aircraft going 340 knots with the speed brakes fully out down at low altitude. Reflect a reality sim. Graham, you were asking me about what the point was for having a approach with no vertical guidance, but only LPV lateral. Well, this is an RMP, so it makes some difference. But here we have a case where we're outside of lateral integrity protection. Hey, Captain Crash, how are you doing? 164 meters for lateral protection here. Which is pretty crap, <laughs> to be honest. And we have zero vertical protection. Good stuff. So what are we are aiming for? 2,500 feet. That I tap, and then we've got the final approach fix at 13. Well, we can just set it down to 13. We'll maintain 2500, make sure we don't go under. Instead of combustion cutoff ratio. Oh, exciting stuff yourself. I see. You're having fun yourself. But what did I look? I want to put in here like that and go to approach reference at 50 degrees at the field or something like that works good stuff and we're gonna go to 
Landing field length, LFL. Yeah. Testing some corner cases. So you'll notice when we come down here, 7,800 feet, but it says still we're at 8,800 feet geometrically. You'll notice that, actually let's, uh, let's do speed brakes here for just a sec. Have a good one, leading edge. Yep, you've got your bad time. You got to go to so year round, man. The Sahara or Gobi, sort of. Um, I'm landing in the test airport, so that means its conditions may be anything between normal and absolutely impossible. Good stuff. Start bringing the speed back. You might need to pull more speed brake. I'm a little bit heavy here. You'd normally not be landing with 4,000 pounds in each tank. That's essentially almost full fuel load on the wings. Uh, yeah. Pretty close to it anyway. And so, yeah, you have less fuel on board. That's located at Null on Null Island. Yeah, SCIP. Hmm. Go somewhere, speed break out. Full speed break. And we could just go ahead and push this magic button here, approach. We'll see it goes approach LNAV and RMP arm. That's armed for an RMP approach. In fact, I'm gonna keep on decelerating down to 180. 230 knots, we can go ahead and select a stage of flaps. They're conveniently hidden behind that. Gear lever there, or thrust, throttle lever. Now we can stow the speed brakes at this point. You get your light, lighty lights on and everything. You'll notice it's still coming down on V path, the vertical path. But, well, not too far off the reference value anymore. But we're still definitely about 500 feet higher on the actual altitude versus what the altimeter is reading. The altimeter is reading 4,000 now, actually 4,400 feet up. Okay, coming down, coming down to be about 2200 barrel, yes. Challenger doesn't have flaps eight like the CRJ. Yeah, it doesn't. Go straight to flaps 20. Now there's a lot of flap first, first stage, yeah. So, dive bombing on down, we should be just about good. RMP arm around the profile, and once we come within five, uh, not five miles of the final approach fix, which is this thing here, Oridu, or is it no? Yeah, it's Oridu. See, go to goes to vertical glide path, RMP approach. Now that means it's not gonna stop at the constrained altitude anymore. It means I can set this up to whatever. It's not gonna capture. I'm gonna drive straight through the constraint through the selector there because we're in glide path mode. Now notice that even though we should be on what it's what's that what does it say 2.7 degrees, we are quite clearly coming down at a much steeper angle. So it says it should be 2.7 degrees for the final descent. Or well, it should be two, three degrees here for the section up to. Yeah, it should be three degrees for the initial descent, but. It'll be 2.7 for final descent. And right now it's reading 3.4. And we're right on path, vertical path. The vertical deviation zero. But this is barometric right now. So we 
do simulate the correct distinction between geometric and barometric altitude VNAV for approach purposes. So right now, RMP approach just implies barometric, barometric profile. You know, we'll be slowing down and, you know, doing, doing all your approach type things. You'll notice though that we're still very much on a much steeper profile than we would normally expect to be. T minus 270, 726. So final descent should be 2.7 degrees. We're actually coming down. Well, it's kind of fitted about a little bit. Now we're pretty close now because we're fairly low altitude. So the error, the barometric error is very small. Full weather tables are now mandatory unless you wish to fly into a hill. Yes, sir. I'm going to simulate a go around or you know what let's just go ahead and it's not going to level here that's because this well it shouldn't have <laughs> I need to check this oh, it's an interesting corner case well oh, there we go it went away with the GP mode there um Notice how the path here, little dashed line keeps on extending. It just keeps going forward and forward. And that's because I'm right now in sequence inhibited mode because I've passed the final the minimum pro, uh, the yeah minimum descent point or the missed approach point, and I haven't clicked push toga or any done anything. Normally, you just land at this point, but. Go ahead and push Toga. It'll uninhibit the sequence. Get the gear up, get the flaps up somewhat. Strange it didn't remain in LNAV. It should have. Huh. Temperature lapse rate, TLR. Yeah, let's just hold it up nut up up nud. I think two thousand five hundred is the altitude constraint there. Eh, go faster. Faster go better. And I wanna go in here. Hold. Up nut IK. How are you already on IK? Or you should have been at FAA speed. There you are. Anyway. Here's a question. Do I modify the temperature elapse rate with altitude? Do I follow X points altitude? <laughs> QNS reverse engineering, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a bind bender. So, pause you, go away, explain for the time being, and we're going to do some more code. ISO 1976. So the problem is, Captain Crash, ISA is an idealized atmospheric model. Uh, You know that wiki page really well. I would imagine you do. With all your craziness with the engine thermodynamic model there. 
gravitational. So I do vary, for example, I do vary the gravitational acceleration due to your latitude. I may have some, some questions for you, some equations for me. Oh, cool. Neat. How do you, well, I mean, you're basically sitting with your Hindenburg constantly at sea level, so it's not really gonna affect you very much. Maybe using super secret net, any, any builds. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Bus Driver. <laughs> so. Get this cause. Yeah, that's one of the things. That's one of the things for reflected reality sim is I might have to make this switchable because everybody else is flying at the wrong altitudes, but they're consistent between each other. You're going to be the one sticking out, even though you are actually using a proper atmospheric vertical model, which gives correct barometric behavior, but might not match what they're doing. I don't know yet. <laughs> Standard is weird. Everyone could be wrong, but so long as everyone agrees. Yeah, but that's the thing is then I basically, then this whole function of the FMS is pointless. It wouldn't work. It just wouldn't function the way it's supposed to. It would actually be doing the wrong thing. So that's why I'm kind of torn. Like, do I, I don't want, I don't want, I do want correct physical behavior. I'll make it a toggle for those that gonna have trouble with it but I don't know do 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 molar mass ERTB huh keep it accurate let bats some yell about it H minus H B So, would I stack these two on top of each other? That's the question. Second equation is used for standard temperature lapse rate equals zero. Like, do I do a piecewise integration over, over the vertical column? I could. Theoretically, I could, yeah. Dear Austin, regarding atmosphere, I'm trying to do with the atmo density. Yeah. Piecewise integration. Well, in this case, it's, it's literally, I just run the equation several times in a loop for different values of the height and just stack them on top of each other would be a lazy way of doing it. So I could create sort of a vertical column of, of temperature lapse for a TLR values here. Call it, you know, TLRs, whatever. Out to some maximum height, add some steps. Um, what's 18, 20 kilometers at, at a kilometer a piece.
Let's see. I saw a nice chart for yeah, whatever. Hmm. TB, LH, HP. Maybe essentially this equation. TB over T will be one, so it's one plus of that over T. This is a different equation, strange. Fairly different, anyway. Yes, pressure base zero. The exponent here is the same. Yeah, R0, L times H. So this is just, yes, yeah, just difference. L times H. Why is this a plus, though? That's a minus. What are we missing here? Temperature base value. That might just be a different, right? It's just the opposite sense. Or the G. Ah. Uh. Ah, interesting. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Yeah, so they just inverted it over. Weird that it would do that, though. Negative would make it a square root. Or no, hang on. Square root is the other way around. Ah, negative exponents are not really all that trivial to understand, though, to, to kind of mess it with your head. Um, anyway, I mean, they're essentially the same equation. So question is, is the lapse rate a constant? This is the simplified version. So Captain Kraft, what is your opinion on temperature lapse rates? I'll check back later. Mrs. C. I'll see if some, I'll have a good, have some fun with gardening. So Captain Crash, what is your opinion for temperature lapse rate? Do we just keep it essentially constant? Do we uh do I change it over certain range? And also have fun, a bit cold. Come on, it must be summer in Canada as well at some point. Even though it might only last a week or two. <laughs> Not May. Okay. It's back in the igloo. <laughs> Plus 6C. Okay, yeah. What is TLR used for? So right now it's used for calculating the vertical pressure. So really what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to uncorrect QNH for determining the base pressure value at virtual sea level and then computing a new pressure gradient that accounts for the fact that it's Refrigerators in Canada <laughs> keep food warm. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to account for the fact that uh, your altimeter, your the pressure gradient in the atmosphere is going to be different for a different air temperature. Now the question is, I should probably modify first of all, all both the temperature of the air. But um, I'm also, well, I also probably, I'm uh, not sure. Should I modify? And let me think. Um, should I modify the temperature lapse rate with altitude to make the integration work at different, essentially make this not be quite such a neat curve? 
Would that be a thing? Perhaps. Hmm. Now what I should do, now it's gonna be an independent feature. Right, right, right. Uh, lapse rate, lapse rate, lapse rate. Blah, 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 blah. Delta T or delta height, delta Z, yeah, sure. One times curl L. Convection and adi adiabatic expansion. Try lapse rate, yep. Okay, so it's rho G, Z, D, Z. Uh, yeah, sure, cool, but rho is also dependent on pressure, and so we can't a priori just guess at it as two variables. Uh, my vertical integration, I sample rho directly from the sim. Yeah, that's the problem, is the sim gives screwy numbers. The simulator itself is given... <laughs> What the simulator, instead of instead of changing the pressure gradient, what the simulator does is it changes the density. So it essentially keeps explains primary parameter as pressure, and then it goes and changes the um, changes the density to match. Basically, make the gas law work out correctly. Eventually it becomes saturated, water vapor, blah, 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 blah. And the equilibrium water is decreased. Huh. Not that one. That's This is the one I want to look at. Uh, humidity at sea level percent is 18.75. Well, what's the saturation point for water vapor? Is that computed? Heat of vaporization, dew point, okay, sure. Eh, we, can't be 18.75, that's way, way low then. No, 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 it can't be that low. Should be at least like 40 or 50. Nice row. Holy crap, what sort of the optimal? Okay, but that's assuming a standard atmosphere and standard pressure gradients and everything, but that's not the case for uh, temperature correction. Because in temperature correction, we're actually looking at having to change a deviation from standard conditions. Because otherwise, what's the point, you know? Otherwise, you can just look at your altimeter and be done with it. Heat of vaporization. If I just assume a standard, if I just assume a fixed TLR, very useful, a bit messy. Okay, let's see. In URL, density altitude. Sure, yeah, gas law, vapor pressure, vapor pressure. Ah. Water vapor pressure, saturation vapor pressure, blah, blah, blah. It's essentially talking about humidity. If you never move your altimeter, it's always right, right? Yeah. Environmental lapse rate. Is the rate of decrease in temperature with altitude, blah, 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 blah. As an average, yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's just an average. 6.49 C per kilometer. 98 C per thousand feet from sea level of 11 kilometers. Constant temperature minus 56.5, which is the lowest assumed temperature of ice. So the standard atmosphere contains no moisture. Huh. I don't like the idea is the temperature, the actual atmosphere does not always fall at a uniform rate with height. For example, there can be an inversion layer. Yeah. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> Hemolonimbus clouds. Inversion layers are even worse for thinking about stuff. Even so, pressure for sure is dropping.
We do this by piece by piece. Let's say just take this away. Got a 5,000 meters. We'll use this as the base value. So I'll copy you over. Eh, eh. Okay, so if I use you as a base value for the lapse rate. Or I'm sorry, use the same lapse rate. I found looking at all the equations was that without knowing some kind of virtual sampling of the atmosphere in the sand, which doesn't have the data, it starts to feel like chasing one's tail. Yeah, yeah, I know. Anyway, P0 for P0. Go and consider U to be our P0. So that will be B30 times 1 minus height over or I'm sorry TLR which TLR we said is over there so B2 oh crap I hit it when it does this B2 times the height over that field there so that would be A31 minus A830 that's our height above the base reference value Divide by T0. Right, so what's our T0 here gonna be? Let's assume, let's assume it's, 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 um, divide by T0, right? Your stuff, divide by T0 is our elevation here, A30, 28815, that's, uh, right, you're right going to be this divide by not one divide by b2 minus a 30 times the temperature lapse rate is here yeah, sure never fix it for me Hope the problem we did work out the absolute altitude problem backwards given it an absolute altitude. What are the pressure and temperature at location? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to do, Captain Crash. What are the pressure and temperature at your location? Well, no, 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 no. Well, essentially what I'm trying to do, um, I would like the independent feature. Either way is good. Klaus will make it interesting though. The independent feature. I don't know what the independent feature would be. But I'm sure you'll tell me. And we want to go to G, 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 E1 times the molar mass of the atmosphere, which is, where'd you go? E1. E2 actually, E2, E2, divide by universal gas constant, which is R0, so F2 times, times what? L, it's the temperature lapse rate. That is over on B2. I hang on, I calculated for the wrong field here. There we go. Okay, so I can do a piecewise integration here, and the equations do apparently work. We'll pull it out 13 kilometers. Pull that there. Not quite, though. Hang on. No, they don't. Eh? Oh, right. Uh, this needs to actually refer to B30 as a fixed value. B30 is our base pressure value. Still not right.
What are you referring to here again? Comparing something to the previous row. Wouldn't be a thirty. Hey Trachimus. How are you? Okay, so it does so piecewise integration works, it matches. Everything is right with the world so far. Up to row 70. It ranges up to row 70. Cool. So I can do it piece by piece. That works. It's more a matter of at this point, do I want to do, um, do I do, do I want to do varying temperature lapse rates or not? And moreover, I have to start using this one once we hit the, once we hit the uh, trouble pause. Cause this is then gonna, cause then the temperature lapse is gonna be zero. And so these are just gonna be divided into one and you're not gonna get a pressure drop. We were doing a piece by piece. So it assumes, or I could just, or I could just vary the lapse rate based on, yeah, yeah, that's probably what I'm gonna do. So, what I could do, I could instead, I do a weighted average of all the, all the various little pieces of the lap tree. Yeah. So for funsies, let's go and create a vertical column here. I'll call you TLRs and there's going to be I'm going to declare that there's going to be 200 of, of the things. Well, 100 of the things. And we're going to go out to 20 kilometers in, in altitude. Actually, we don't even, we don't have, even have to do that. We can go to less than that, but close enough. And for the time being, yeah, we're just going to go and do a weighted mean right um so now now we're just straight up into crazy experimental fa experimentation territory uh atmos main atmospheric main and uh so what do i want to do here actually i'm going to go into uh, fizz up uh, loop, fizz flight loop, fallback, yeah. No. All right, atmospherics update. Here we go, atmos update. So for Fonzie, so this is running in the main thread, so we can actually go ahead and grab data refs here, do everything. Um, we could go and get a hold of the uh we do have the tropopause location so tropo alt meters in fact i think i already have yeah i already have the value for that so for the time being for just for fun Quick experimentation time. You know what? TLRs are going to go away. Not going to work this way. There's going to be a way to meet from Tropo to below. Uh, I was thinking about doing that, yes. But in the end, I might just go assume a fixed rate up to Tropo pause, and then just sort of level it out. And then I just integrate the two pieces based on the, you know, ratio. Um, think. No, hang on. Should it be, will that be right or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Would that work or am I, it won't. Okay. 
Yeah, I was yeah, I was worried because that would just completely change the slope of the curve. Yeah, no, it wouldn't it wouldn't intersect correctly. Anyway. Okay, cool. So that approach shelve it. <laughs> What I could do, well, for now. For now. Okay, screw that. That approach won't be, won't be good at all. Won't be any good. So should I, so how do we calculate the temperature? One of the things that's kind of annoying to me is the fact that an X-plane, for whatever reason, as I said before, um, your ISA values are fixed, essentially. Right, so down here, low altitude, I've got ISA plus 30, almost 35. If I climb up, it goes to ISA zero, effectively. Like, there's no, there's no ISA variation. How do I get that up there? Pretty sure that's incorrect. Uh, you know what? Screw this. Let's leave it as is. I need to think about this somewhat more in, in, in sort of a quiet environment where a stream is, is not that. So for the time being, screw all of that. We're going to go straight to messing about with the FMC. So FMC time. Leave all of that. Uh, does it even compile still? It does. Cool. Uh, does something. Good stuff. And let's go ahead and mess with the FMC. So what I want to do is implement the temp comp feature. Not that page. That page. And we want to go and implement this part. Temperature compensation. Good stuff. So approach airport data, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. So I should have really created a template for this. I remember I should have, should have a template for a subsystem because I've been creating so many of the friggin' things and I almost keep on looking for one I can copy and then just adapt. Rock page. But you know what, we'll, we'll copy you. You're gonna become my new prototype. Um, prototype FMC subsys. H and FMC subsys C. I'm sick of having to mess about with this every time. So get the copyright correct at least. Um, subsys, whatever. That's going to go in there. I have FMC subsys, whatever. And it's going to be that okay ava serialize yes render utils no conf parse yes no okay that's gonna name the hard problem is still training i ran after several weeks yeah 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 probably it's not gonna be an easy fix so Wait, I wanted to keep you more or less. Huh. Okay. Like this and stuff return true. Make a MS pilot operation pop no error. No error. And it's going to do something here for some sort of a key. It's going to say do something. And if pop is not no error, FMC set pop FMC P full stuff over here. We're going to make this page title page zero sub pages 
Gonna go CDU screen, put separator, as many of them do. Put separator screen. And uh put LSK. LSK action or LSK title for L1. Sample. And we're gonna grab we have an LSK action. And yes we do. Sample. Sample like this. Stuff, color white, gonna be LSK L1, sure. Um, CDU put screen. You're gonna go on, I don't know, you're gonna go on LSK whatever. Test. LSK two row, or whatever, test. Actually, you're gonna go up, eh, whatever, for this guy. Go ahead and copy this. L six index not not the title I actually want to copy the action here. L six is gonna have the index key which is on a lot of things. That's good enough. And I'm gonna call you X X X X prog key and These are the actual versions of the pages, so those are going to go away. Go away. Stuff, and I want to go here. Type def struct subsys t serialize start marker end marker. Good. Key functions, I don't care about that. Flight plan manager is definitely gonna have an init function in him, right? Not perfect it. There, this is the thing that I wanna grab. Still the prototype. This. Init. X, 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 E. We're going to call you for the time being. Freeware or payware? Payware. Return true. And data pointer is going to be set to whatever we generate there. Stuff configuration is optional, oftentimes not used. Do, 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 do. Stuff and replace here. X X. Well, not everybody knows, um, so that's that's fine to ask Pilot Pro. You know, not everybody who comes around here in these corners of the internet knows everything about everybody, so it's perfectly fine to ask. Initialize, finalize, good stuff. So this is my little template here, and can't. And check the data pointer like this. Good stuff. And instead of called prog draw, you're going to be called xxx draw, xxx draw. And assert data is not null. xxx is going to be data. xxt pointer, that thing. Good stuff. But never expect to normally be freeware. Yeah, don't worry about it. Stuff like that happens. Uh, cool. And do we have an index key? No, we don't. And here, anyway, there's no key handling in this part, but there should be one in here. 
CDU index. No, not the DAPR index. Do we have an index return function? No, we don't actually. Funny story about that. Do we have one here? No, we don't. Uh, which page does have an index return key? Mm. Definitely on legs. Reference computer SBAS select. Ah, oh, right. GNSS control does have an index return. Yes. So there's going to be a version of what I'm looking for here, which is L6, this thing. Save that. Good stuff. It's the draw function, init function, key, and. Finally, we're going to have to write a quick serialize routine. Serialize, it's going to be the best value for me. <laughs> oh. Perhaps. Serialize, so there's no serialize feature here, but there is a serialize feature here for sure. Do, 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 do. And. All you XXX is my little helper. XXX manager, grab the data here, XXX and serialize as data. Good stuff. And then there's going to be a deserialize function. Deserialize constant serialized data. Serialize function, this is going to be const. Deserialize data B, return true. Uh, bool, good stuff. Okay, it should be about as bare bones as a as a uh, subsystem template can be. So I'm actually gonna create a little bug tracker item for that. Be lucky, it's even where. <laughs> Well, hopefully we're gonna have fun with it. Uh, cool, so want a template for subsystems. Uh, code, or need a code template for subsystems. Good stuff, save you, do that issue, get commit. Gonna go in there. Hopefully I'm on the correct branch. Yes, I am. And push. Change it in the repo or in the server. Actually, already in the repo. Or and implore added and commit on the PL21 branch or sub submodule. Good stuff. Neat. So with that out of the way, I can now go ahead and prototypes, prototype. FMC subsystem H. You're going to be called FMC subsys temp comp H and temp comp C. And FMC subsystem temp comp H to sort IAPS FMC subsystem temp comp C stuff. Instead of XXX, I'm just going to go ahead and replace this with temp comp. There we go. <laughs> yeah, we should end up with something that's almost immediately compilable. It's going to require a few more edits. So replace these macros here, temp comp. Also going to have to then generate a new entry for it in here. Uh, Subsystem temp comp. Actually, I'm gonna put you ahead of all the debug menus just for funsies. Um, you're gonna go in there to send info. Oh, that's a nice one. You're gonna love that. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna also include temp comp temperature compensation. And I also want to add you to the C or CMake file. 
temp comp C, and it's also going to be down in the headers. T -t -t temp comp. Temp comp H. Is there a trust limit page, or did I just skip a beat? I don't know. Okay, yeah, it was there. It just needs to go in there. And. Oh! Okay, now I know why. Recompile. And right, okay. Uh, needs to go and include temp comp. Almost. And close. Uh, so it's FMS pilot operation pop no error. And 57. Just call you TC. Temperature computer. I'm going to say that you're currently unused, so it's a little bit unhappy about that. That's fine. 95 CD screen put separator. It's a declaration. Okay, that needs to go and include common, uh, actually two directories of common CD screen.h. Thank no. No, 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 no. CD screen put separator. What did you, what did I call you? Where are you anyway? Separator. Put page separator, okay. Put separator. Put page separator. Okay, one, three, four. Some comp serialized, dual comma. Good stuff. Now, and finally, when we come up here, we go for quick and dirty tests. I'm just gonna go and stick that in comp. And it's going to go in CDU pages, CDU page index. And where are you? You're located on page two, R5. So page two, R5 key handler. Where are you? This is page one key handling, page two, R5, FMC, CDU set FMC subsystem temp comp good stuff bring up x-plane again on pause you actually we're not going to reload you but you're going to be a little bit pissed off because of the fact that i've added stuff to the state so it's 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 going to be a little bit broken right away but don't worry we'll, we'll fix it hopefully huh it's fairly unbroken uncharacteristically unbroken but if i now go to index and this is not available yeah yeah sure go to index page two temp comp we got a new subsystem here with various like little printouts and all that kind of good stuff and this already works we can return back to the main page arrival data works now, this is just you know display stuff Here's a neat one. Um, I've not found a faster way to get to it so far. So on VNAV Descent, go to Descent Info, and you can punch in an arbitrary waypoint along your route or a runway at your destination field. So let's say we're gonna, so we're right now, our destination, go to flight plan. Is there SCIP? So I know there's runway 10 and runway 28 there. And it's immediately going to give me a direct vertical profile to that runway such that if I, let's say, am planning a descent, I can quickly get a beat for, you know, what sort of descent rate and what sort of vertical path am I going to have to do to get down there. So let's see. Let's imagine that I'm going to go and just push up into a climb here. It doesn't matter. Heading mode. And you'll notice it actually is sensitive to our as yeah, check speeds because we are in a hold. Thanks that we're in a hold anyway. So ignore that. Go away, go away. So 
So it gives you descent predictions. Normally it automatically, when you don't have anything in there, it will put in your next en route flight plan constraint for the relevant phase of flight. Since I don't have anything in there right now because I've got no um, remaining three points on a flight. I mean, you could re here's a neat little trick you can do on a balance system. You can resequence portions of a flight plan. So you can go like that and it's basically re-enter my entire approach. And now if I go into perf VNAV last page descent info, it automatically defaults to the nearest descent constraint that I got on my flight plan. Right now I tap with 2,500 feet or above. Uh, it's basically nothing. But if I had like 2,500 below. All right, no, it needs a climb, it needs an adder buff. Oh, hang on, oh, right, it thinks that I'm in a climb phase yet. All right, because I'm, <laughs> I'm so, f I'm not close enough to actually yet be in a descent phase. So it thinks that I'm still in climb or cruise, but basically it's looking for an adder above. I think, where is it? Good question, I'd have to check. Be lucky it's even more oh, very nice yeah so i keep forgetting what half of this stuff does let's go to someplace interesting uh let's go mess about at dca adca washington sure rock and roll Actually, I'm going to ha go and have, while it's loading, I'm going to have a quick uh, break here back in uh, five minutes. Just quick bathroom break. So, if you, go, if you, you know, do your things. Alrighty, back in business. Here we go. Rock and roll. Simulator is coming. 
for the streams. Actually, I want to make you a little bit larger so you can actually fill the screen. Good stuff. The uh, APU's coming up. So what was it that I wanted to show you? <laughs> I sort of been showing this as pr some previous, well, a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of, a uh, couple of nice little, uh, nice and fun little images in Discord. Okay. Generator on bus. Cancel all the alerts. And so one of the things that, if I load an approach in here, uh, DCA to DCA, sure, whatever. Or we could just go and do, I don't know, uh, Teterboro to DCA, sure, why not? That's kind of a realistic fate. Well, the other way around, probably. Uh, tab, good stuff. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, so what I wanted to have a look that is in here. So all you, you know, your, all your nice little, you know, approaches and stuff. And so if I bring up, do a sky vector. This work? Yeah, it works. Well, sort of. Um, you got Teterboro, KTEB. That's your typical sort of business jet airport. That's when I'm sort of picking it to give you sort of a realistic of look at stuff so a little bit of a backstory on rnav approaches you know you've got your if you've ever wondered why there are some of them are labeled gps and some of them are labeled that or all or almost all the AC screens are poppable. It's great for cockpit will we'll screen positions remember. So not right now, uh, Pilot Pro, but eventually, yes, absolutely. They will all be, um, in fact, not only Pilot Pro, actually, <laughs> let me show you an even funnier feature. Um, got the APU and GPU running. So. You know, uh, for all you cockpit builders, I've made an extra effort to make it, you know, usable for you. Just get my stupid face out of the way. Thank you. Well, let me just get some tea. Thank you very much. Ah, pro, you're gonna love this. So. You got your pop-up panels here for extra stuff, you know, things like your overhead and everything. How do we draw this? You know, is this uh, a pre-drawn image? You'd think so, right? I mean, these are, these absolutely are pre-drawn. This one, however, is not. Because if I bring it up here, you'll notice a, hey, okay, so that, you know, that moves and everything. Um, so that's all cool stuff. And it's really not all that, it's not really all that exciting. You know, this could still be a pre-drawn image. So how do you know that it's not? Well, here's how. Just get that out of the way. Data, I think it's under data. Ah, there we go. Do, 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 do. Let's go to let's say overhead. Yeah, sure. Um, overhead, 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 overhead. Allow moving. True. True. And now, if I go and do a reload of the aircraft and skip the art reload. Do a quick reload of the of the simulator here. So now, if I bring up this here pop up panel, you'll notice it's starting to draw some like some coordinates down here. And yes, you can reposition them any way you like if you want to, you just got to edit a config file and you can even create your own pop-up panels. And it even understands uh, manipulators. So 
I've made sure that it has some history in this room. So it doesn't have those. Basically all the manipulators that you've got in the simulator, it will understand as well. This should basically let you use like a This will basically let you use like a, um, uh, a touch screen if you want. And you can create your own pop-up panels, as many as you want. Just edit the, all you gotta do is basically just uh, go in here and edit this config file. You, you can create your own. What you gotta do is you gotta populate it with objects. So you basically gotta tell it which objects to render. It doesn't auto, auto render everything because that'd be a huge cost in rendering performance. But yeah, you can create your own. That isn't the problem. That's what this was basically designed for. And they also support um, these guys. You can also permanently position if you want them somewhere specific on the on the virtual desktop or desktop in general. So you can mess about with that. And I'm also gonna make it such that it works for these guys. These are somewhat more lightweight. Um, the reason why I'm using uh, some of these panels here for sort of pre-drawn stuff because they are performance-wise less costly. The fully 3D render panels do cost a little bit of performance, especially when you when they are redrawing some imagery on them. Normally we try to optimize it such that, um, well, I explain kind of not happy with the texture resolution at this point because I've been consuming a bunch of texture resolution there, texture memory. But if you've got a GPU that isn't complete crap, this will actually work better. Um, you'll see it right now it says, you know, zero FPS. That basically means that it's avoiding redrawing the panel entirely because I'm not inter interacting with it. Um, so even even though I can hover my mouse over the panel here, uh, yeah, resolution exponent just gone to shit. Um, even though I can hover my mouse over here, it's not costing me any redrawing time, but if I, for example, start interacting with stuff or any of the animations happen that need to be redrawn, it will actually animate. And explains automatic resolution scaling. It's just decided it's run out of memory completely and needs a restart. Lovely stuff. Explain you piece of crap. Anyway, I got to reclose explain here and restart it just so it pulls itself together. That's just the explain, uh, explain Vulcan engine kind of going a little bit crap. They peer in pair side. Yeah, um, for some panels, we do have to redraw them continuously, especially, uh, well, for basically for anything that has like a, like a screen on it, like an EFIS screen, CD screen, that kind of stuff, we redraw it, I think like five or 10 times a second because of the fact that the contents of the screen are now not, not data ref driven for everything else that is simply switches and that stuff that physically moves in the cockpit or lamps that come on stuff that is data ref driven i can detect when the data refs have changed and then we own and then and only then do we redraw the image otherwise if nothing's moved we just keep it the way it is it does not uh react to explains lighting so if, if it's night outside the panel will not go dark Oh, I might do that. No, I'm not really sure anybody really cares enough to want that on a on a pop-up panel. Anyway, uh, APU is on bus, right? So what do we want to do here? Uh, that's not what I wanted to push. Um, cool. Um, I wanted to bring up this thing here, and I want to bring up this thing here. Cool. So. Why are some approaches labeled GPS? Why are some approaches labeled something different? Um, so they basically come down to this. How are, or how is the final approach segment from your uh, final approach fix here controlled down to your this approach point, runway, whatever, what have you. So the Challenger supports basically two kinds of RNAV. Um, it supports conventional RNP RNAV or uh, what they call well, essentially LNAV, VNAV. That means your lateral position is essentially considered, well, it's lateral position is controlled by GPS, but this LNAV, VNAV minimum 
has a very wide range, very wide accuracy range of up to 0 0.3 nautical miles. So required navigational precision only 0 0.3 nautical miles. That's basically your, your, the declared accuracy of your receiver, um, worst case, right? So that'd be something like this. RNAV RMP Zulu one niner to Teterboro and you'll notice it says RMP well this is 0 0.1 this is authorization required but uh it's a fairly wide minimum 0 0.1 for a GPS receiver is huge that's like 180 meters of inaccuracy on a GPS receiver that's miles that's like insanely huge insanely bad reception now or they figured out that, you know, you could, you could use, and by the way, consequently, the minimums are fairly high. You're talking for LNAV, minimums are lower than LNAV, VNAV. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can see that basically brings you down to 500 feet above um, on the approach here. 500 feet above the runway is, you know, reasonably low, but it is not ILS cap one levels of, of minimums. That's because laterally, even 0 0.1 nautical miles ain't anywhere near ILS localizer type performance criteria. So to work around that over time, well, we figured out, you know, there are ways to make sure a GPS receiver is more accurate. And so we've developed, so it's developed essentially into these um, other types of approaches, LPV type approaches, localizer, localizer type performance with vertical guidance. Now, in the US, those are usually noted GPS, but uh, the point is that they give you uh, localizer type accuracy on the final segment here from your final approach fix down to the missed approach point. The, crit the critical part is that the lateral scaling here um, on your lateral scale starts shrinking down. Now, you don't see it over here, it enunciates ang as an angular scaling. It no longer is a number. It's not 1.0 nautical miles, 0 0.3 nautical miles. It's ang, meaning it essentially simulates a localizer type cone as you're, that's narrowing down as you come down out of the runway. And the vertical guidance part is another important aspect is that the vertical integrity of your GPS signal. Now, it doesn't mean that there's vertical angular scaling on the on the uh, display here. I'm um, sorry, I kind of put that off the wrong side there. So you're not gonna have, so this is gonna be angular lateral, lateral scaling, but there's not gonna be necessarily angular vertical scaling, but you are gonna get a very, very high integrity signal on a vertical accuracy axis which therefore lets you lower the minimums down to 300 and there are even approaches down to 200 feet above field level or above touchdown zone. That's essentially, you're looking at, at ILS category one approach minima just using GPS or just using your RNAV system. So how, does, how do we assure that a, a GPS receiver has sufficient um, accuracy down to those kinds of minimums? So, GPS normally will automatically do that, but there are problems with GPS. GPS notably is subject to things like things like multipath distortion, ionospheric interference, and spoofing, right? So GPS signals can be can be degraded. To avoid that, there is a thing that has been developed over time called satellite satellite satellite-based augmentation. Well, there's augmentation in general, GPS augmentation, and then there's ground-based augmentation and satellite-based augmentation. The Challenger supports satellite-based augmentation only, not ground-based, so no GLS approaches. So GBAS is a different, GBAS is a ground-based augmentation system. WAS is a SBAS system, satellite-based augmentation system. And the Challenger supports, if we go to here, let's see, index, next page, GNSS control, select SBAS. The Challenger supports four different SBAS providers, WAS, EGNOS, MSAS, and GAGAN. And so these first two, so, th so these guys are, the WAS is the American one, EGNOS is the European one, MSAS is Japanese, GAGAN is Indian. 
So they all provide slightly different um, levels of integrity, where WAS and Agnos are pretty much the same in terms of integrity. Uh, MSAS is RMP 0.1 only, so only lateral. And Gagan has coverage these days for vertical and basically it's almost pretty much Agnos and WAS integrity. So how do these manifest? Well, in your receiver, you go to GNSS one or two status, you can go to the page to page number two and you'll see service and use WAS. So right now I'm in the US. The US is covered by the WAS satellite system, which provides what they call horizontal and vertical protection levels, HPL and VPL. Right now we are at 10 meters and 36 meters or 33 feet and 117 feet. That does not mean that the, that the augmentation system gives extra accuracy to your receiver. It doesn't. Uh, the receiver already has a already a horizontal figure of merit of two meters and a vertical figure of merit of four meters. So it's much better than the HPL and BPL values. Rather, the, the augmentation system tells you that even though the receiver says that it says these are its, its accuracy values, I have checked externally and the USS uh, essentially integrity tracking stations, uh, two or three places in the US, uh, where they check for signal integrity correctness and they are providing assurance that within your region right now, where you are located, there's a 10 meter assurance of on the lateral axis and a 36 meter or you want in feet, 33 feet and 117 feet on the vertical axis. How do we determine these? I didn't just pull these out of my where the sun don't shine. So, because I'm weird, I've gone ahead. You can actually get this data for the respective system in real time on the internet. So what do we do? Well, we go ahead and talk to the actual service provider. So you can go ahead and so this is what we use. I literally, the airplane in real time, every five or 10 minutes, it downloads this chart looks at your position on that chart, looks at the scaling and determines what your protection level is at that point and whether you're actually able to receive the service. So right now we're in WAS lateral accuracy basically down here near zero. So that basically means we're down like 10 meters of lateral accuracy, lateral integrity. And we are also at, go to GPS, WAS vertical protection level. We are on the WASP vertical protection level, still fairly high, you know, 30 meters or better. And it does read these in real time. If you keep this up, you'll see, <clears throat> you'll see the times here change over time. That's, uh, you can also see it over if you look uh, on your log file, you'll see these lines occasionally popping up uh, as the airplane is downloading new WASP data and new EGNOS data. Right now I'm not in EGNOS coverage service, <clears throat> in the coverage area for EGNOS. So it's only going to download it once and then not again. But once I enter EGNOS coverage area, it's going to re-download the data again. Um, for Gagan and AMSAS, unfortunately, <clears throat> this data is not publicly available. So there we have to kind of guess in. Did you see it? It just refreshed the data here. And the shapes of the outlines and the cont contour lines changed. Yeah, apologies, I gotta mute my mic here for a sec. Oh, kind of losing my voice here. I should stop yelling so much. Let's talk more softly. Cool, so this is how we determine it in real time. And with that in hand, and also by the way, if you wanna see your European equivalent, the European equivalent, here's EGNOS for horizontal protection. And here's EGNOS vertical protection. And if I was in EGNOS coverage, it would actually show up in here. There's no WAS in Hawaii. Yes, no vertical guidance anyway. No vertical protection. Um, so at Hawaii, you are basically not guaranteed coverage very well, very much. Yes, no vertical protection. There might be horizontal protection. <clears throat> so if we go to, 
horizontal protection, there is some protection on the lateral axis. Need to cut out the UK from Agnos. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> it's not like they're going to turn it off or, or, yeah, I got it. I mean, it's not like they're going to turn off um, the thing to cut it out or something, but yeah. <clears throat> so right now I'm, I'm in WASP coverage and you can go and actually mess about with it. So I go and bring this up in here. I can go and kill the WASP provider. So there are, you show the European again. Remember the proper fuel heating value for the Hindenburg fuel. <laughs> Good stuff. Always great fun. Which are the European one, the, the horizontal or the vertical one? <clears throat> Damn it, I got some stuff in my throat. Here's a here, European horizontal protection and both would be nice. Uh, so you're asking about the, probably the fact that the vertical and horizontal levels are different. Even though the scale's the same, um, the protection integrity is, is not the same. That be it. <clears throat> yeah, so horizontal and vertical protection levels are not the same. And usually horizontal uh, is better than the vertical one. And <clears throat> I also compute dilution of precision. So there's another chart here that we pull in real time. PDOP, the precision dil or position dilution of precision. Oh, there isn't much data. <laughs> Dutch Caribbean light fuel oil. <laughs> I would imagine so, yeah. Light crude. <clears throat> so this is a piece of data provided by the U.S. government for essentially the entire planet where they tell you um, if you've got what sort of expected integrity level you would expect for unaided GPS. So when they're like light blue or green or whatever, the PDOP value here is an abstract number. It basically tells you the about the quality of GPS reception in that respective region. Right now, they're all very good. So dark blue is, is like super great and blue is still very good for general navigation stuff. As it gets higher, accuracy starts degrading. And mostly these are due to the due to loss, of, well, ionospheric interference, basically. Um, so there is such a thing as space weather. And when there's bad weather or, or bad atmospheric conditions for GPS to operate, you can actually get a significantly degraded accuracy on GPS. And we do simulate this. So we do look at this chart. And when, they're, when you're sitting in sort of a, a worse than ideal condition, we actually decrease your GPS integrity. The SBAS system is designed to slightly compensate for that. So it will actually help you out with corrections, but it will not alleviate your, your woes completely. How do you cor correlate DOP to service integrity? So it's a somewhat fuzzy, fuzzy metric. So right now what we do is I your, your service integrity is primarily controlled by what satellites and what geometry they're in. So we do calculate the local DOP for the satellites that have been chosen for your guidance uh, right now by the, by the receiver. And uh, we compute a sort of figure of merit value. So that basically controls the distribution of the error value, sort of the fixes that we give to the GPS receiver. And if you're sitting in a lower integrity region where that DOP value was on the chart was lighter blue or, or going into the yellow, we'll basically just inflate these F, these figure of merit values and that'll make the GPS receiver have less accurate data. So it will dr tend to drift off more off to, you know, one way or the other. Uh, the blue line, the blue squares or the blue crosshairs there that it's drawn, those are basically the individual computations where it says like, OK, I'm here now I'm here. I'm over here. I'm over there. And then the green sort of fuzz in the middle, <clears throat> that is the outcome of the Kalman filter that th these solutions are all get fed into. So 
you want to look at that, you can actually do that as well. Take a shot, Pilsner ish. Um, so there's a ECEF position solution common filter. This is the actual solution that the uh, well, the blue, the black dots there are yeah, drink. The black dots there are the solutions coming out of the GPS receiver. So that's basically the crosshairs that are jumping up there, and then the the solid lines going through there. The solid lines going through there are the con the consensus for the column filter. So what it what it thinks that is actually the correct solution. So it sort of bumps about, but you can see over here on the Kalman filter, it, it shows this is in meters, right? So this is ECF frame position in meters. And you'll see this is right now a span of just two meters. So we are basically jumping about in a span of, you know, maybe half a meter. Uh, we're not quite sure where within that half a meter you are. That's about it. Um, but if this starts growing very much, then if the if the spread of these numbers starts growing very very large, and yeah, you can actually end up with quite a lot of error. Point for GC is going to be withdrawing all the LPV approaches, right? Oh uh, yeah. And so this is ECEF data. So basically, that's the native GPS position. GPS operates in the ECEF frame on the WGS. 84 ellipsoid. Then from ECEF solutions, we also compute some trend data, which is in the local frame. Um, so it gives you your, your, it basically tries to guess as best as it can. Note, now, keep in mind, GPS does not provide track, doesn't provide heading, anything like that. GPS just provides a position, a current position, nothing more. If you extract extra information out of that, things like direction of motion, vertical speed, um, ground track, that all comes from later on down the line, if you synthesize multiple GPS readings together and you then try and generate some sort of useful information out of that, that's what this is showing. So right now we're stationary, so the aircraft kind of can't really make up its mind which way we're facing. This could literally just be spinning about uh, the, the track arrow here because it has no clue whether we're moving anywhere. In fact, we're not. Um, so this is just right now completely bunk. North-south velocity, it gives you that. Uh, and uh, acceleration. These are, again, all essentially all of this data here that says trend, trend data, those are derived from sequences of measurements and basically the knowledge that the GPS receiver has, like, okay, so even though these measurements for you know acceleration here are jumping all over the place like minus 49 to plus 49 meters per second per second it knows that okay these are probably bunk you're not going to be accelerating at five g's in one direction um that's just not going to happen so it knows to basically draw a straight line through that data set but if you are actually in motion and it sees a consistent you know plus one or plus a tenth of a G in one direction acceleration. It's pretty sure, okay, you're probably accelerating in that direction. So I'm just gonna start increasing these velocities. And then from that, it can try and synthesize more accurate track trends and vertical speeds and all that kind of good stuff. And the outputs of all of these column filters, you can see the, these are basically sort of the uh, chewed up and finally processed data for you to be looking at as a pilot or the avionics to be using for, for actual navigation. So runway ends will suffer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the UK and finding an LPV approach there. Huh. That's that was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a challenge to find anything there. Hmm. Funnily enough, even I don't think even Navigraph has uh, uh not an hour graph um frankfurt doesn't even have lpv approaches i think they have they're really really heavily invested in in, in gbas there so gls approaches with ground-based augmentation and will be for a long time now yeah yeah the uk is sort of regress regressed in that respect i guess anyway do you all you know what this kind of a display represents. This thing here on the right side. The left side is obvious. The right side, not quite so obvious. 
anybody's wondering, do let me know. I'm going to need to re-enable. Sky view of the satellites. Yes, it is. Re-enable loss here, and we'll lock on to the service. Yep. And this here in the center is basically the zenith. Yeah, so it's basically showing you a different representation of what I have and here, which this is from the airplane's point of view. So if I spin the airplane around here with the map, to spin the airplane around, these are actually gonna spin around with me. But this is just a debug view for you to be staring, staring at satellite equivalent of a star chart. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> So these are the satellites that the GPS receiver on board sees. Got Garmin on their boat, boat during fog has double checked that picture in detail many times. Yeah. <laughs> so this is basically just a different representation of, of, of this. Hey, welcome Mauix. Am I actually running in real time? Pretty much, almost, not quite. But yeah, here you can also see the various states of the augmentation systems, satellites above horizon, PDOP value right now being applied to my measurements. These are mostly debug screens, so you're not actually, you wouldn't see this in the, in the actual aircraft during flight, but you can stare at them if you want. But right now, vertical protection level by, S, by WAS is 36 meters. HPL is 10 meters. The requirement for LPV approaches in the aircraft is 40 meters horizontal, 50 meters vertical. You plan to include RJB, they're going to be there. Yes, they are going to be in the final product. These debug displays are just going to be here under plug-in CL650 debug. You can just mess around with them if you want. How do you pull this GPS signals? Where do I pull the signal strength from? Pilot Pro, so the GPS signal strength here, the way it's, it's computed. So I know the rough average signal strength of a GPS receiver. So I, based on that, I know the rough radiated power. And after that, I'm using a little library called, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the ITM, the regular terrain model. E ITM is a, C++ rewritten originally in Fortran library that given a sequence of points between transmitter and receiver and a terrain uh, relief between them and some other parameters about the signal. So things like wavelength, uh, polarization, the type of em environment along the way. So whether you're, you know, you've got some water under there and, and everything else, it basically calculates things like tropospheric distortion, reflection, um, that kind of good stuff. And it gives you a decibel, a, a decibel signal loss value. So I know the rough base transmitted power. I know I can stack that value on top or, or basically uh, subtract your signal loss out of that. And from there we have a decibel value. And from there i roughly know what sort of signal integrity and strength you're going to see so that's what the uh, signal strength displays there were based on for each of these we know their rough signal strength and the receiver here the virtual receiver will try to pick the best ones it can get it get its hands on so for example even though there are satellite 13 so prn 13 8 and 6 are all uh, usable they are, the, the, the receiver can see them, uh, but they are so low signal strength that they would actually, their, their measurements would degrade the overall accuracy. So would ITM be good for implementing low, long range HF? Uh, perhaps. ITM, I think, goes down to two megahertz. So, Going down below two megahertz is slightly sketchy. It will give you a solution, but it might not be very accurate, um, but it might work. Anyway, until advanced RMP and LPV becomes a normal type of approach, much better terrain and noise friendly approaches. Absolutely, yeah. 
so I've been yapping here about the satellite portion. Now let's talk about the airplane portion. So this is just, you know, your data screen. That's just leaving so that you don't have to do uh, autonomous integrity monitoring checks. But here's a neat little thing, which I didn't load on approach actually. So let's load on approach into Teterboro. And let's go for, which one do we want to pick again? Uh, RMP X-ray, whatever. Let's go RMP X-ray or RNAV X-ray six. Doesn't matter. So you'll notice that the receiver or the air, the FMS gives you a bunch of toggles here on the arrival data page. So it not only gives you information about you know your wa your WAS channel and your glide path angle, approach course, and blah blah, but it has a couple of toggles here. Fun 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 little toggles. So what do these do? Um. And if you select a, an approach which does not support LPV, you won't get those toggles. So if I go and select RNAV Zulu in here, you're only gonna get RMP and Barrow, that's it, nothing more. But if I have an RNAV LPV approach capable, it gives you the option to toggle between them. So for funsies, let's go ahead and Let's go and load in a flight plan back to DCA. I'm just gonna do a quick test. Get some hydraulics going, get some fuel pumps up and running, and hold the button down. Engines be spooling. Can you actually hear something? Or did I? That some sounds up. It's just incredibly quiet. Sound settings. Input applications. F mod is fully on. Just out of funsies, is it possibly? Now it's not respecting my volume control here, so that's not the problem. Oh. Okay, for some reason, now listening to my, okay, whatever. Well, you can hear it now. <laughs> Good stuff. So let's get the other engine going. How many engines pull up? Close enough. Captain Crash, you got uh you have code for ITM? Yeah, or, or did I send you some? Well, it's supposed to be, you know, I'm, I'm the star of this show, so you're supposed to primarily hear me, not the aircraft, um, but it's supposed to be loud enough so that you'd be able to hear something. I don't have ITM. Um, okay. In case I, uh, so it's part of Lib Radio. It's integrated in there, so you should be able to get that over on my GitHub. If not, do let me know, and we'll, we'll send it over to you if you want it. stuff yaw damper stab trim good stuff perfect breaks off and we'll just toss the airplane up into the air usual style <laughs> did I got the brake there get the brakes off yes I did good stuff okay rock and roll where are you airplane uh, toss you up there. About, yeah, sure, that looks good. Put you up in somewhere about here and make you head about there. Are we moving at some speed? No, we're just going to fall out of the sky like this. So, rock and roll.
it, your ears just blow out. You know, well, almost. There we go. That'll be better. Good stuff. Okay, let's go to 3.5. Slight little change. Altitude select capture. Good stuff. And uh, depart arrive. Uh, depart arrive. Depart. If we arrive. Depart nav, I think, 1.9. No, 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 that's, that's an RMP approach. 3-3. Three, three. Yes, that's an LPV. We got to approach data. We got LPV stuff in there. Perfect, perfect. Performance. Go to Rustlet performance. Like so, and... Go to 210 knots. Out. Like that. Good stuff. It will be kind of neat to let HF users. I mean, IT. So the problem really is more about you having enough um, uh, ground sampling points. I'm just going to take a little bit of fuel off the aircraft because it's going to be hard to do an approach just here with this much fuel on board. 1200 kilos is going to be enough for that's almost uh, it's two and a half, well, t over two hours, two hours and 15 minutes about of fuel. Do I got any payload on? Way too much payload. More like 400 pounds, like two extra people. Two or three extra people. Good stuff. By the way, the payload does the base, the empty weight of the aircraft already includes the pilots. So you don't have to add the pilots on. So the problem with uh, using ITM for long range communications is the fact that you're going to have to have some sort of a terrain shape in between them and loading in that much terrain. I mean, over over water makes no difference, right? But if you're going to be talking about over terrain, loading in several thousand kilometers worth of terrain data for from DSFs, well, that's going to take a fair bit of effort and memory, I guess. But yeah, that's, that's going to be a fair few. And we're still at very high temperature here, so I'm just going to go ahead and reset the temperature back to default. Now our geometric altitude should actually... You know what? Okay. Um, I'm going to show you the difference between the various approach modes. Um, that'll be probably easier to show with barometric differences, so... Let's go ahead and, well, we're in the U.S., so let's switch it over to inches. No problem with solve. So let's switch it over to inches, and we'll go to, I don't know, like 3030, right, uh, on both sides, so that we don't get the airplane yelling at us. So right now, we're going to be about 300 feet higher than what we think, or lower than what we think we are. What's the field elevation there? Uh, DC is pretty much pretty close to sea level, isn't it? It's that's the direction. Ah, uh, fourteen feet. What's the survey field elevation? It is fourteen feet. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. So we can go ahead and do this like so, and you'll see the difference pretty, pretty obviously. Um, we'll go and roll you up even more. 3040. So right now we're about 400 feet lower than we think we are. We should think we should be. So I'm going to go and so we've got LPV was selected. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to reselect the approach here just to make sure it's properly sequenced. Go to JNIV Direct, Enter. LNAV, actually ARM, Approach LNAV, LPV ARM. And you'll notice that now it's giving me, it's going to start giving me, yeah, atmospheric propagation and effect bounce. Yeah, sure. That works too. Your approach stuff and everything. 
you know, you'll see that right now it's, um, we're still selected for the approach data here, arrival data, LPV was, and if I go, I can actually change it so far for the time being, RMP LPV was. So that's all fine so far. That's because we are right now in LPV arm. Wait, I'm gonna go down like this. VNAV path. Minimum is 1400 for the strength there. Good stuff. Just gonna go and let the aircraft descend down with the path here. Five seconds to top of descent. Coming down. Now, we're coming into Padway. Padway is our final approach fix. You'll see that there's 3.0 degree glide path from Padway. We're still more than five miles out, so it's still not gonna switch to LPV mode. So LPV approach is still only armed, but you'll notice that in pretty short order, found a V pitch, armed glide path, but it's not intercepted the glide path. So normally what the thing does is it automatically tries, let's go ahead and level here at 2000. Now let's go level at 2500. We're gonna level at 2500. And as the glide path comes down, now the predicted path, according to the chart, if you go to the charts here, uh, our on our GPS 33, we should be at exactly 1400 feet at Padway. That is what the chart says. So let's see what the sim says. Notice how the airplane is suddenly starting to pitch up. What's up with that? We're coming in within two nautical miles of Padway. And it's gone from Barrow VNAV slowly starting to blend in to geometric VNAV. So that's the difference between Barrow VNAV and, G and GPS VNAV is that now we're actually starting to come down on this on the dis proper descent path. So now we just passed Padme, Padve, but it's 1800 feet on our altimeter so what's up with that why is it so high it's going to re-intercept the path here and all is good here it's a little bit unhappy with me not having my gear down and everything I'm actually sort of barreling down a ILS approach or the LPV approach so now all is well but Notice that even though it says we should be at 14, it's 14, you don't care about your fancy pressure system, you failed to set correctly, yes. The GPS, it's right now, you'll see that we've got a thousand feet here on the altimeter. If we go to the GPS display here, status, it says we're actually at 478 feet GNSS altitude. So what's up with that? That's because this guy is geometric, right? So this guy doesn't look at um at my fancy pants barometric altimeter which i set badly or which you could have a barometric read error because of temperature compensation which, which is what i've been working on today and so in spite of all of that this is why we have uh gps approaches and lpv approaches in the first place is because they are independent of your barometric system or barometric selections any reading errors on your bar on your barometric altimeter it's driving us correctly down. So it's 210 on radio, 222 on, on the GNSS altitude. So this is almost perfectly in line. The field elevation here should be 14 feet. That's essentially 10 feet. It's basically nothing. Um, so these guys are agreeing. My barometric altimeter isn't. That's the guy that's set badly. Um, and even if you had it set correctly, you could actually have it over or under read if you had a temperature differential. Let's get the airplane back up. 
rewind the approach back, put the airplane back where we were roughly, go to like, I don't know, 3K or whatever. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quickly unpause this, go and hold the current altitude, retract flaps, sure. And we're going to go and reselect the approach, restart it again. RNAV33, execute. Go direct Janiv, not that. Direct Janiv, enter. Arm approach mode. Well, the alert here is just stops blinking at me. And this time I'm going to go for LPV Barrow. So now we're going to be in localizer lateral scaling. So it's basically going to create that narrowing window for the defla for the deviation scale but we're going to be barrow vnav so the vertical path is from here on out going to be controlled by my barometric altimeter how far in front of the pilot position is the hud next to your x on your hud uh what do you mean there the the hud projection is focused at infinity that's kind of it's kind of the design here, such that you, you can't actually see a very move very much. Or do you mean like where in reality would the projection be? Many of these projection systems, so there'd be a projector up here. This is a collimator glass. So it's basically designed to make sure that all the light rays coming off of that reflection are almost parallel. So it would be essentially effectively at infinity. In reality, it's usually focused at something like, I don't know, 10 meters in front of you, such that when you move your head within the confines of the glass, you're not really going to see any movement at all. And the idea is such that the symbology is conformal with the outside environment, such that it really, where it points down, where it says minus five degree here, that is really where minus five degrees are in the physical world outside. And same thing, especially for things like the flight path vector. That's how it is actually able to give you that that kind of a consistent display. I'm just using this here thing just because it's a little bit more convenient. So the primary flight display, flight display PFD. So I've rearmed approach, um, LPV arm, but this time we are in Barrow uh, barometric glide path mode because let's say we don't have the vertical integrity on our WAS system. So we would be, uh, you know, looking at um, a vertical protection level that is not sufficient for LPV vertical guidance, for geometric guidance anyway. Okay, coming up to top of descent, I've got my pre-selector set lower, TOD blinking, and in five seconds after that, it's gonna switch to path mode. We're gonna set this down to the uh, minimum descent altitude here for the final approach fix, which is 1400 or above, but it's good. It will actually arm glide path mode before we get there. So it won't really make that much of a difference. So, glide VGP, glide path mode is armed. So you'll see it will be... Now, now, if I try and switch it now, by the way, it's already... You'll see it's gone to LPV APPR approach. If I try and toggle the modes now, it says toggle not allowed. It, I should have switched it before we got to this point. Once we're in the approach mode actually inside of it, then we will lock that selection and will not pre will prevent me from changing it. Now notice it still says vertical deviation nicely zero feet, everything, I'm fat, dumb and happy, as can be, we're driving perfectly fine, all is well, right? It says 1400 feet to pad bay. I can just go ahead and roll this up now because we're not even gonna stop at the altitude here. We've already, we're already in glide path mode. So as soon as I pass pathway 1400, it's going to go to runway, uh, vertical constrained, and it's just going to keep on driving that, that vertical constraint, what it thinks. Now keep in mind, this is based off of my barometric altimeter. So we just wait, 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 wait. You can already see the problem arising, sort of a go away with this. You're not going to be able to quite so easily notice the problem, but if you had a HUD, or you had some sort of a, well, on a and here's the trick with synthetic. <laughs> I can already tell it's off. Yeah. Not usable in a home cockpit with a projecting system. I suppose we could project it onto some, some sort of a surface. Uh, gear down. So let's go to 
menu, I'm going to enable synthetic vision, and it thinks, you know, synthetic vision ain't quite so clear that we're, like, somewhere off. And so, synthetic vision ain't really all that much of a help here. But you can see that we're driving, if we turn on the HUD and compare with the outside environment, we're driving way short of the runway. We're going to hit on this side of the river. Don't need to collimate the, the hot IRL. Yes. I mean, you would have to collimate the, the actual projection system, yeah. But I can give you the image if you want it on, on a separate screen. That's not a problem. So you'll see, right now it says we should be a thousand feet above. Almost a thousand feet above. Well, radio altimeter says 440. This is why you have GPS uh, geometric approach type guidance, even the option at all. So this will be bad, you know. At this point, you should probably be screaming because you've still got two miles to go, but your radio altimeter says we're just about to hit the runway. In fact, there's a little embankment here. We drive right into the thing. So, before we actually ride a thing into the ground, I'm going to pull us back here again. Lovely stuff. An EGPWS. Yes, it will be screaming. Uh, EGPWS is based off a of GPS altitude for exactly this kind of a reason. I don't have EGPWS implemented right now, but you would be probably getting plenty of alerts right now. But at the same time, you would be like, why the hell are you screaming? Are the magenta dashes we saw on SVT the runway axis? Yes, they are. Yes, that is the runway center center line. When you are within, uh, when you're within uh, ten or seven miles, one of those of the runway, it's going to go into that kind of a display. Okay, so quickly load the approach up again. Execute. Go to chain of direct. Execute. Approach arm again. Got a nice top of descent computed. All the good stuff is there. Maybe not the aircraft close enough to the runway that may not alert. Yeah, that's also another problem. It really depends. So it's one of those things, right? If you were really grossly off on the altimeter, EGBW is probably going to save you. But usually these things are, are such screwy stuff that you just ever so slightly are off just enough to like run into some, I don't know, light pole or, or power, power line just in short of the runway somewhere. He says something about including manual dock with the aircraft is too early. It's too early to tell. Yeah, it might not alert. It really depends on you just having a, a lucky or unlucky break. So let's stop being stupid and make it actually make it actually work in a manner that is. That might get you killed if you're not careful. So, since I have implemented temperature effects on your altimeter, let's pretend you've got, well, this is sort of an, a bad example, I guess. Let's go to a different airport. Uh, let's pick. Let's pick something. What's the Canadian one that has like truckloads of various terrain all over it? There was there was one over in the north. Uh, hey, Drac thirty seven. How are you doing? Uh, reflective reality sim. You were flying there. You were doing some of the experiments there in the Canadian airport. CYCG. Yes, that's the one. Or. CYLW. Kelowna. Yeah, that's the one. Kelowna. CYLW. Whatever. Go. Rock and roll. Rutland. Hopefully, I'm still streaming. I think. Seems I am. Who knows? 
Yeah, still got scenery. Uh, just might be on the edge of having any. Do I actually have scenery here? Uh huh. Uh huh. Hmm. Asselgar, yeah, yep, yep. Aspen is great for terrain avoidance. Yeah, Aspen might be what we need to go to because, yeah, I, I've got some cut off terrain right there, so that ain't gonna work. So, Azzy, here we go. Does Aspen even have an approach for with sufficient nastiness? Uh, Arnaz, GPS, Foxtrot. Fairly boring, but it might actually work for us. Yeah, that'll do. We should be able to show the effects of isn't on the sea. Flat Earth confirmed. The Langoliers are coming. <laughs> Eating the past. Yeah, that was a freaky movie. So, engines go in. Just a for you. I am a first time explain pile. I would like to know where to get things for explain. Um, lots of different places. Uh, not really. I'm not really sure I can help you much. Is it really Aspen? Did I load up at the correct airport? Apparently it did. Okay, I'm probably facing the wrong way around. Yeah, yeah. Never mind that. Doesn't matter. Okay, so we want gens. And we can grab, put that one away. Doot, 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 doot. Oh. Good stuff. Breaks off. Let's get some stuff going there. Actually, I'm gonna first. Eh, we don't have to even put in a origin waypoint. We could just shove the airplane up here. Get some speed going. Purchase all start over here northways, so let's go like so. And get some speed going as uh, said before. <clears throat> and gear up. Yeah, about 180 will do. Get the auto throttle engaged. Come on. And about 15k we're gonna maintain here 180 perfect good stuff and we got terrain what a thunk okay i don't actually need the terrain here and i wonder of these so instead what i wanted to do here is temperature at nearest airport. Let's make it uncharacteristically hot at Aspen. Make like, I don't know, the sea level temperature or what is that? Just out of funsies. Let's see what I, if I set something in here, what are you going to actually do in the simulator? That temperature, sea level. Okay, so it does actually adjust for sea level change. Good. Okay, so in that case, 
I'm gonna make it look plus 30 around here. That'll be fairly, fairly hot here. Okay, for destination, we go to Azzy. Approach. Uh, which one's the one I was looking at there? GPS Foxtrot. Or, there's another one. Running Forks. Yeah, sure, this one. From. Red Tabor or Lens. BBL. Execute. BBL direct, execute, give me LNAV. Good stuff. We've got something going here. A better way to refer lapse rate, pulley, SL, temp, data ref. Uh, so that is already what I'm doing. I'm, as I'm looking at, at that essentially. Um, so, SID2. Huh, I've kind of messed up my little steering configuration here. Okay, get the autopilot back under control. So I've been thinking about, you know, the thing is I don't want X-Plane's temperature lapse rate because I kind of don't trust it. Oh, it's drawing something stupid there for the missed approach. Or is it? I don't know. Get that going. Good stuff. 14 or above. So, no, hang on. The other way around is what I wanted to do. Rather than make it a very, very hot, I'm going to make it very cold. Let's say it's minus 30 here at Aspen. Fourteen or above, so let's go to fourteen thousand down. I don't trust much of anything about Explains atmospheric model. Yeah, that's the thing is, you're just never quite sure if there is some screwy stuff inside of that. So, because I mean, I already don't trust Explain for its magnetic model, so. There is that. So right now we should be 14 or above. Altitude MSL. I've changed it so that it's, well, it's slowly gonna set up the new temperature value. Top of descent. V nav going. What is the final approach point? Ooh, 6.2 degree descent. 10 8. So notice that it says essentially it's steep here. Yeah. So notice that essentially we're we're you know at, at essentially zero zero climb or descent rate, but we still got a V path that is pointing down. It's because of the fact that we're slowly integrating the new value for the temperature correction. And so we're essentially entering a region of overreading. So you'll see that we're still sorta of descending thirteen point four. But it's reading 14,000 on the altimeter here. That's why you would want to have uh, temperature compensation here on your altimeter for these kinds of approaches, because that is a barrow glide path mode approach. So that is definitely going to need some barrow corrections. Okay, I'm going to get some more tea. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So coming down with the B path here. Threshold elevation 7680, glide path angle 6.22. That's gotta be, gotta be a sporty ride down. 
we will want to be so Waslo is not quite on cap is the final approach fix or, or yeah it's final approach fix yeah cold kills yeah I like the I like the version that goes high to low look out below because it works for both temperature and pressure so right now you see it says we're at 13,000 seemingly according to the altimeter but we're actually 12.3 and we got the barometric correction set precisely it's it's that's what the QNH value is at Aspen let's see has it actually already correct not quite yet but yeah, it, it, the barometric setting here at Aspen is 2992, so it, it's that's the correct setting, right? But you can see, according to the flight path vector, we're running fairly low-ish. In fact, if I make it very cold, let's make it really cold. Make it like minus 40 temperature limit for approach and landing, but make it really, really cold. Now it's still not quite adapted to a correct altitude here. I'm looking at the temperature reference computer system and it's adapting slowly, but as said before, it's designed to go uh, slowly so that there aren't any large discontinuities. Waslo. Now again, we've got the correct Barometric setting in there. No alerts, nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, first officer of Dreadnought here is Captain Todd Ricker Biggins is approaching to Aspen. Gone ahead and asked her if flight then is to be seated and I've turned off the fast seat belts. Turn on fast. Please remain seated for the duration of the flight. This one's going to be steep. So let's go and arm the approach mode. Light path arm, glide path capture. But even though it says 11.5 here, we're actually at 10.8. We're much lower. And at this point, you would probably be sort of, uh, you know, you know the area. It's the missed approach, by the way. Missed approach, go around is 14. At this point, you would probably be a little bit concerned because those hills are coming up. Well, I mean, you might not actually be able to tell just a couple hundred feet difference. But if you are familiar with the area, you're gonna be wondering like, why the hell are these things so freakishly low? Uh, pretty much scraping the bottom of them. 10.8 and we're actually at 10.2. We're about 600 feet lower than we should be. That's the radio altimeter going. <laughs> we just follow the highway. Now yeah, that's, I guess, a way to do it. Is there really such a turn? Linds. Let's see. Right. Best approach, hold. Nine point two at Joe San. Yeah, we nine point nine two. Yeah, eight point eight. Yeah, here we go. Here's a dive down. Yeah, this is... Now it's it's gone over and captured the proper glide path six degrees down, but... Notice we're coming up very short of the runway. I just left it like this, so it'll basically drive us down. Eh, oh, alright. Past the last point there. past the missed approach point there so it didn't want to keep on driving but yeah that is why yeah low temperature kills cold kills now turn is there if you want to do a hard missed approach yeah classify it as a terrain escape maneuver ASUN ASUN Haley Valley
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. I can I can believe that. Yeah, I'll run with three one. Neat. That looks like fun. Great spot. Not far from me. Ah, oh, cool. So I can make the filtering system go a little bit faster. As I'm looking at it, it's taking forever to change anything. Yeah. But 91 gold with this stuff. So it's in fizz.c and Atmos main. Right now I want to go a little bit quicker. Like so. Need to find out how Aspen works in the 650. It's way beyond the aircraft's limit. Is it? I've seen 650s at Aspen or Challengers anyway. I mean, if you do a visual approach, if you don't do um, some of the instrument stuff there, it should be perfectly fine. Uh, perf, resume 230. Good stuff. Oh my, that's a lot of stuff there. Thank you. My cup of tea is ready. A glass. Some liquid in it. It's all good stuff. How'd you fail? Ah, right. I was still in. Or was I? Huh. Okay, we're probably very low temperature here. Hmm. We're actually outside of the operating temperature regime of the aircraft. So we should probably raise the temperature here a little bit. Nope, not that way. That way. Good stuff. Open fighter 5.5 .5 is a steep approach beyond 5.5, not authorized, but maybe because of final is a shallower. Will they get away with it? Maybe, could be. Jackson Hole. I would be good for high elevation exercises. That's quite cool. It'd be quite cool. Does the ADC apply? No. The data is available in, these, in this airplane. No, it doesn't. That would mess up high altitude performance. Because then you would be flying at a different elevation, a very different elevation at high altitude with respect to everybody else. When you're in, uh, you know, things like the flight levels. You could be different by thousands of feet. So it is not temperature compensated, no. Not automatically, anyway. <laughs> and another one of my plenty of uh, old pattern entries you've seen before so it's just going to sit here and I don't know sit on its ass apparently we're holding over a piece of road we're actually at an intersection here Oh, yeah. What's the other approach there? I was kind of weirded out. There was another one. So, Dep R. What's RFF? From Red Bluff.
DBL, HEPEB, MathMoo. Look at the other one. We're going to take you over to plan display mode. Get the range way down. Let's go step through the thing. Yeah, just a straight in. Not very, nothing very original. And then this ADC is quite dangerous in winter. Well, suppose. you accelerate there mister got to check why it's gone into all oh, right I know probably huh that's dumb it could be applied the result would be a non-standard altimetry yeah Yeah, they just got to be consistent with each other. It would also not work at high altitude between the um, aircraft. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody basically got to agree on it. kind of tempted to just go and uh, calibrate the lap trait based off of the X plane one. Now that's unfortunately not going to still make the ISA go, you know, pear shaped and everything, but it's going to result in less errors at high altitude. That might be a middle road. Then I don't have to put in a switch for the function. Yeah, let's do it like that. Gonna be somewhat lazy here. Uh, we'll we'll test it out, see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll we'll do some more thinking. You know, head scratching, ass scratching, one of those. Okay, go back to full screen display here. I'm gonna let this thing sit in the hold till the cops come home. I don't need you. I need you. Actually, I want to go up here. Is dot C. What do we decide to do? The air traffic should be aware. Change that would put you in the terrain, but pilots always need to be aware of it. Room bear approaches. Yep. So I've kind of decided. Um, Captain Crash to go with the approach of essentially looking at the ISA deviation or what x -Plane says that we should be doing. And, uh, I don't know, I guess using that somehow. I haven't figured it out yet. I think so we're going to be on top of the descent soon because we're heading towards it. Then we're going to turn back. Huh. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, Atmos main. So this is just adjusting that part. So that's a little clear. Uh, PS I'll update. Gear forces update. Atmospherics update. Cool. Now, T0 value. How do we compute that? We compute the P0 value here for a standard temperature lapse rate to match what x -Blink thinks is going on in the sim. Should we be changing this or changing that? Hmm. Thank you. 
Good question. Huh, we got an inbound actually, an inbound hold. Right. Push there. That's the thing I wanted to push. The approach apparently has a hold at Red Bluff. Sure, let's do that one. We want to see what a hold entry looks like on a, a what do they call it again? A hold in lieu of procedure turn. Helped. Lovely texture quality explain. Thank you. Very, very cool. Yes, it's pressure standard change that it's pressure static. Thirteen point seven there. Cool. You know, I haven't even checked the BNAP functionality through holds, so hey Matthew B B seventy seven, how are you my dear? I'm doing well. Get to see more streets, yes sir. What if we go to automatic speed control? That's uh, not really gonna change much of anything. What sort of speed are you aiming for? Yeah, it probably thinks that's his final approach fix, so therefore it's slowing down to 200 or something. Just gotta keep it at 230. <clears throat> Thinking about working with eyes of deviation to problems that counter with X plane changes in row. Yes. So there is an effect with. There is, in fact, what the actual lapse rate is. Remains unknown to me. Yeah, I think it actually just iterates a table or something. It's fairly stupid like that. What if I roll this down? Are you going to start a descent? And if so, what are you going to do? Oof, pretty close to those mountains there. Not very low. Or not very much headroom. Thousand feet. <laughs> Path mode is a little bit confused. No, not that. That. Still pretty cold, yeah. That's I've got it still set there. Yeah, I mean I've still got it set to very low temperature, so yeah, we are very very low. I'm glad to see though that there's plenty of margin over at Aspen, apparently. Okay, so now it's coming on. So what? It's about took about 20 minutes so i've shortened the interval there but now it's for the qnh reference it's using pretty close to the aspen field elevation there i'm happy with that probably an old question i guess the challenge will live have its lib rain so ice and rain effects correct i'm not sure if it's going to have lib rain or if it's going to have something different um but it will have ice and rain effects yes it doesn't right now because i kind of didn't bother so far, but yeah, it will. Worst case, it's going to have Libring. Let me put it like that. But I know that there's better stuff in the pipeline. Make or Malarimais. 
Mm, Ryan Meister, this is the sort of thing that you probably just want to simulate dynamically. That'd be cruel. Uh, don't, don't give him any ideas. Dude has... He's got the guts to do it. Or I guess the craziness for it. Don't give him any ideas. He might just do it. LR with rain. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Who knows? Who knows how far my code base has reached? Perhaps I'm going for world domination. Or perhaps I'm just talking crap. Approach LNAV, RMP arm. Again, this is not an LPV approach, so. We go to arrival data here. RMP only, nothing else. And we need an RMP of 0 0.3. Now, what I can do is I can go in here. Can I? Will it alert if I go ahead and disable WAS here? It won't. For an RMP approach, it won't yell at me. Now he's about to explain get ahead. Would help devs with a better weather better weather for once yeah that'd be nice all right notice this it's automatically gone to exit the hole so even though we were in the hole you notice as soon as we turned inbound the whole circle there disappeared if we go here you'll see it says exit selected i can cancel it i can continue in the hold if i want to but um, this is a what they call a hold in lieu of a procedure turn. So all we did is a hold entry. And as soon as we sequence out of the hold, we're going on with our lives. We're, we're continuing on. Well, there we go, V path. Sequenced on, and down we go. V out select cap. That's a weird procedure. Is Alex the final approach fix? Oh yeah, probably is. Actually, 12.2. There's a 12.9, it's 12.9, yeah, yeah, that's the one. EPEB. Maybe not. V out. What sort of a weird procedure is this? Are we supposed to stay at 12.9? What you doing there, buddy? 150 feet low. BGP. think it just got excessive rate of closure on the capture path there. That was a weird one. Off for XP-12, say moving clouds with winds. I don't know. I don't have XP-12, so <laughs> I couldn't tell you, even if I wanted to. The thermal simulation condor does a, still does a better job. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I would imagine it does, yes. So, final approach fix. You should not... That excursion there on a VNAF path, that's the thing that I'm going to have to take note of.
Wow, 290 knots. <laughs> nice one. Lower weights, so the thing is just absolutely going bananas right now. Let's check X term. Like the sailplane seem to do a better job. I mean, obviously, that uh, kind of goes without saying. Up we go. Well, this kind of worked, mostly anyway. Let's have a look at the... Uh, this one you're going to love, or like, I hope. Sion, that was a fun one to code, or, well, debug, really. <laughs> What's the biggest feature left to implement a challenge, or are all the big ones already done? The big ones are mostly done, yeah. At this point, it's mostly tying up loose ends. The sort of big scary ones were VNAV. Well, right, there's still some pieces of VNAV that are missing, but you know, the espresso machine. Uh, there's still some pieces of VNAV that are missing, but for the most worrying part, which is descent VNAV, uh, that is already done. Actually, let me reload the airplane because I wanted to pull in some new code here for the temperature simulation. <laughs> Cappuccino maker. So, minus 30 here at the airport. Gonna be a good sporty approach. And it's a long enough flight that we can actually get some work done. That looks familiar. Yeah, I know, right? So, let's go ahead and quickly fire it up. That was a fun light reflective reality sim that you designed there so i'm absolutely gonna steal the idea and just go ahead and mess about rip around on it get that engine start we're actually gonna do a flight we're not just gonna toss the airplane up into the air that off some atc going <laughs> oil pressure is high because we're we we're we've got very very cold oil so it's got to warm up and as you know you absolutely should know when the engine's cold soaked oil's at minus 20 c uh when the oil is very very cold needs correct physics to operate realistically though um, so when the oil is very, very cold, it uh, becomes extremely viscous, right? So it has near the bottom edge of its operating temperature range of like minus 40 C. Uh, you're looking at oil that is thousands of times, well, not quite, hundreds of times more viscous than it is at uh, sort of room temperature. Not 4,000 pounds, that'll be a few people do too many. Put on like, we're doing a bit of a joyride here, so let's put on like four people, that'll be about 800 pounds. We're gonna put on the appropriate amount of fuel, so I'm gonna actually remove some fuel because we don't need quite that much. Fuel 650 fuel tanks, so I'm gonna put on about a ton. Aside, yeah, good enough. That's all good. Emergency lights, it wants yes, fuel temp, fuel low temp. It's all noted. Get those lights going, get those lights going. Go to the summary page. Yeah, the engine bulk temperature, the engine fuel temperature is low. 
It's going to warm up, though. The fuel is pretty much cold-soaked at this point. Completely. Basically, when you load up the airplane in, a, in an environment, it pretends as if the airplane had been sitting there for all day long. So fuel coming out of the fuel tanks here is at minus 23 Celsius. So we're basically building up heat in... Uh, why is it thinking that? 4,300 feet. Where'd you pull that data anyway? Oh, right. It still thinks that we were at Aspen. Okay, well, never mind that. So just moved the airplane and uh, did a quick reload. I didn't need to make this aware of, of sim position changes. You might be able to see there and slowly scrolling the altitude the altitude there gonna go to 30k right away why not and we're gonna go to runway heading get rid of this and that and actually while we're waiting for the fuel system to heat up we're gonna go and do a fun little flight here from Sion to Sion uh performance initialization i am lazy i'm just going to pull the tank values i'm going to do that about 150 pounds of crap on board got to go to about flight level 300 on this little round trip takeoff temperature is minus 30. did i actually i didn't actually select a, a departure runway 25 Take that Spessar 3 uniform high performance departure. Go to arrival. RNAV 25, Via Grana. It goes about to November. And there's some discos we got to tie up here. So we're going to go from Spessar direct to Grana. If I bring this over yonder. Plan. That's a bit of a mess. Yeah, so we're going to go, and so right now it looks like this. Bring it a little bit forward. That, so we're going to go and tie you up. So, va 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 Vader, going to go there. Grant is already connected to the arrival. Good stuff. Execute. I'm happy with all of this. Lovely stuff. You can go back to system display. Summary display. So I wanted to go to actually perfect takeoff. Runway two five is already filled in. Good stuff. Minus thirty degrees outside. Got nil wind. Auto throttle is going through a little self test here. And actually, we're going to be on Cal Anti-Ice, or, or actually, well, let's pretend you yeah, might need to be on Cal Anti-Ice, sure. Not really going to affect performance, at least not the V-Speeds. Flying performance, you could do all that kind of good stuff. I'm not gonna. I'm lazy. So, at this point... What we can do is we can push, as soon as we push the Cal Anti-Ice system to on, we're also going to get the low temperature wing anti-ice system coming on. So that's over. And watch it behave or operate here. So push that guy on, push that guy on. And even though I didn't specifically request wing anti-ice, see? As soon as I push both of these on, the wing anti-ice comes on as well. IGS is fun and normal explains the IGS is interested to be on service coverage area, so you can do it properly. Oh, yay. I guess that's a good thing. Oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, I can't do this. That's why I posted a fail message there. No cowl anti-ice with engine bleeds on. So, bleeds off. Good, and now we've actually got ATS. 
available. Now, arm VNAV, arm LNAV. So we got them both in white. They're enunciated here as well. Alt V, LNAV one. Get the AP up and running for bleed or get your jackets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, it's it's 10 degrees in the cabin. It's perfectly adequate for a Canadian aircraft. Don't you think that it's it's fine? Plus nine. It's dropping, but it's plus nine. <laughs> and for all you American friends, that'll be 40 degrees, 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the cabin, so 48. There. Perfectly fine temperature for everybody. Balmy. Right. That's what I'm talking about. You know, do you think cold rises and heat sinks? So <laughs> let me actually get some lights going in here for just a sec. Uh, I mean, inside of my home here. It's starting to get a little bit dark outside. So fuel temperature is up and running. Oil temperature is good. 22 Oil pressure is in, in the green, so we can rock and roll. APU is available. We could put it as a backup on bus. It's not actually going to be used when the APU, when the engines are running. Uh, when, when the engines are running, the APU is just available. It's not going to actually do anything. And since we already had APU bleed on, who cares? And load the APU down pretty good. Cool. So yeah, as soon as I selected the uh, bleed config for 10th stage here, it deselected my takeoff thrust value, and that immediately then went to go and post a fail message there. IRS is just aligned, so all is well on IRS front. IRS control. Good stuff. Well, actually, it's under positive is where we want to be looking here. Viruses are good. Rock and roll. Yeah, so that's why when I when I selected the uh, when I selected the, in, the incorrect bleed config, I gotta cancel that fail there, and then I go and deselect engine bleed, reselect tenth stage bleed, and now the ATS should be happy. It'll only come on right now when I've, I've, I've basically, at this point, it's not armed. United States of Hot Start Landia. Yes, sir. So look at this low N1 value for takeoff. 83.6% of this kind of a low temperature. What a pretty low value. So get rocking and rolling. One more thing I'm going to show you that. Um, one of the features of the low temperature wing anti-ice system, as soon as I, so you see right now, it's still feeding hot air to the wings. So it's basically, you know, it's 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 running the engines uh, or running the wing anti-ice to, to make sure that um, the wings are just slightly above frost level. So it'll, it'll stop once the wings get to about 20 degrees or 20 something degrees. And it'll cycle them when it'll basically keep them between about I think like five to twenty degrees something there. It basically has a little hysteresis range there, just to make sure that the wings do not ice. There's no frost on it. Again, there was a very famous incident with that where a Challenger 604 stalled on takeoff. So even though they thought that they, their wings were sufficiently clean. Um, I think they had de-iced, but not very much. And they did have their, their Cal anti-ice on out of, out of Aspen. No, no, no. It was in Birmingham, I think. There's some, I think it was in the UK. I don't remember anymore, though. Um, could be on uh, windshield anti-ice, by the way. There. These lights and good stuff. I don't know. Uh, it, uh, I, I'd be lying if I said I knew. Uh, but yeah, it basically iced up on takeoff with the loss of all hands. So that was not fun. 
121. So we're just going to roll this one up to like, I don't know, 180. 185. Rock and roll breaks off. And by the way, notice that when I, when the engines spool up, the low temperature wing anti-ice is automatically going to kill the bleed here. I think it's about like 13 degrees, 14 degrees, somewhere where, where it triggers. Anyway, uh, if I spool the engines up, as soon as I pass the 19 degree throttle angle mark, it's designed to automatically it passes. G, thanks for the follow. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Oh yeah, flaps. <laughs> yeah, good thing. You, you, that's why you're the pilot and I'm the idiot. Uh, I'm also going to roll the stab up a little bit. So yeah, it's designed to such that you don't actually have to consider the system in your takeoff performance computation because as soon as you apply takeoff power, the system goes away and so your engine performance is going to be restored back to normal. Vacuum. We might even be able to see that on the bleeds uh, on the engine temperatures here. It's going to be a little bit difficult to see with the ITT changing with the engine performance changing. That was see oh, let's see where's the trigger point there so i let the itt's here stabilize and see and the itt's drop down like a rock go a little bit colder and the itt's shoot back up because of the fact that we've re-engaged power now if i go to full idle anyway cool rock and roll breaks off let's get this show on a road Turn on synthetic vision here. Why the hell not? These temperatures are dashed because of the fact that we've uh, we've got you know, pro heats on, so it's going to go fairly hot. Let's go. Brakes off. ATS is on. It's not yelling at me with any takeoff config warnings, so hopefully we're mostly configured for takeoff. 80 knots, 83.6, so thrust set, rotate, oh, that was a short takeoff roll, low temperature takeoff. LNAF V pitch, at this point you'd set your speeds and everything, I'm going to leave that to the pilots to do it actually correctly. I'm an idiot, so I'm just going to go and roll it up to like 180. Flaps up. We're above target speed plus 5 and accelerating, so good stuff. Quite the attitude, eh? For takeoff. So, coming up, actually these can go away. These can go away and we go and transfer APU over onto our bleeds over onto the engines at this point. We have to do it anywhere but before 15,000. Rock and roll. So, isolation valve will close and engine bleed open. And we should still be pressurizing, so we check your pressurization system up here. You're not losing cab, actually. Landing field elevation needs to be set. We're not losing pressure. And we got a alert here. 13 or, well, it was 11,000 is where it started to hold here. Because there's a constraint. As we clear it, it's automatically going to continue the climb. Gonna take the engine bleeds off. We can actually accelerate here. Uh, you know what? Well, let's go into FMS speed control. It's already pre-armed flight level change because we're less than a minute away from 
continue to climb. In a few seconds, it's going to beep at me again. Bottom of climb. And there we go. Clear the constraint. Up we go. And the engines are, we're at a low weight, not much fuel on board, not a lot of people on board. So the thing climbs like a friggin' rocket. 13,000, another constraint to clear. And getting close. Ready to climb power. Good stuff. Ten seconds to sequence. Bottom of climb. And up we go. Got a standard pressure, probably gonna switch over to gonna switch over to metric uh, or hectopascals, shouldn't I? Yeah, okay. Big enter, enter, yep, and be gone. Cool. And the airplane's gonna do airplane things. Next stop is a thirty thousand, so it's gonna go. Past here at Barrer. Turn back, inter re intercept the path, and just carry on. Just the performance you want in the mountains. Yes, sir. I mean, it's low temperature right now, so I kind of expect the thing to be flying like a, like a freaking crazy thing. So, right now it's going, right now it's doing the origin to destination blend system, so we're sort of in a range where the um, aircraft thinks that we're halfway between our origin and destination, but they're the same thing. So it's just adjusting to the same target. Cool stuff. Lighty lights are off. Actually, AP should have been off. Ready. I think start limit is 25,000, so we weren't on bleed anymore. We're just running the APU. Uselessly burning fuel. Got about an hour at this burn rate. But it's actually going to come down. It's going to be less than 1,000 pounds an hour once we level off here. Pretty soon it's going to go make the turn. seconds burn has initiated and rock and roll So even though we think that we're at 26.5, we're actually at 22.23,000. That's the effect of that very low temperature. I might just extract the deviation here and use that as the temperature elapsed rate. So that's what I've been kind of thinking about here. Captain Crash, what is your opinion? You've kind of been studying this probably a lot more than me, messing about the X-plane atmosphere, so... 
Should I just use a standard temperature lapse rate irrespective of whatever X plane's saying for your ISO deviation and that kind of good stuff? Or should I infer the actual lapse rate off of your, your you know, predicted or, or your actual ISO deviation gets and all that stuff? I'm not sure. I could compare certain parameters, I guess. Thirty thousand coming up. Now it's still gonna maintain twenty five two hundred and fifty knots, even though I didn't actually change anything here. But it should maintain the constraint. Yeah, so we're on V now. Performance increase should be three hundred knots. Now, the reason it's maintaining two fifty because this intercept leg has a constraint for 250 so until we pass that intercept bisector it's not going to accelerate once it does once we pass the bisector there it's going to accelerate although i guess we could go faster i don't know why they coded it like this i think it's really a kind of a poor so one approach i was thinking about is computing oat at two different elevations computing the local lapse rate from that i'm very hesitant to pull data from x from x plane so the thing is i mean i could compute oats at two different elevations but the thing is i'm trying to determine lapse rate from i mean i'm trying to compute lapse rate so in order to compute pull the oat from two different elevations okay um yeah there we go. 300 Mach 0 0.80. And accelerated we go. We go and, and kill whatever's here. Sure, go away. I'm going to bring you over to present position map. Normally you keep this over on the HSI display like this. It, it's really your choice to put on there. So pulling OAT at two different elevations. The thing is, how do I determine? Like, oh, x is not going to give me that. x is only going to give me OAT at sea level. And it's going to give me OAT at my present position. So, I mean, if I am at sea level... I am at sea level. That's, I guess, one way to do it. But. They're very close together. I could say whatever, but um, I don't know. Yeah, so we're at 30,000 virtually, but it says that we're physically at almost 26,000, so almost 4,000 feet low. ISO minus seven. The only two OATs that x has available are where you are currently at and sea level. Already using that sea level one, so do I just say screw it and just use your current one then Compute a lapse rate from that. I guess that's one way to do it. I'm kind of guessing it's actually going to come up with fairly bunk numbers that way. We can pair. We got the simulator running already, so who cares? We can just go ahead and mess around with it. Um, so, uh, temperature underscore. So, ambient is minus 51.16. Let's bring up a calculator here. 51.17 whatever and at uh sea level it says it's minus 26.84 the one minus the other that's the difference of 24.36 divided by our current altitude in thousands of feet is 25.84 whatever close enough um so at this point so this is essentially just one degree 
for a lapse rate. That's, I don't know, that doesn't seem right. I think it should be colder. Did I calculate that right? Do the sea level, do sea level and current geometric altitude OAT check. Then I would try and figure out the model by logging the geometric altitude versus OAT. And run an LR on that and make the model. Um, linear recurve, I think that's what you mean. Um, that's really sort of, yeah, it's really hardcore reverse engineer what X Plane does. Um, I don't know, that kind of feels weird. I mean, I can look at the X Plane source code itself. It's, it's, I do have access to it, but. It's not that I don't know the mod or I couldn't find out what the model is. I can. It's more a matter of like I don't trust whatever Austin did. That's the thing. That's it's sort of more my my gripe there. Minus twenty six point eight three four. Yeah, proper pause. C is minus fifty six point six. That's just ISA. Uh, uh, I think, yeah, that might be it, isn't it? Can I adjust this? I can. So I think, yeah, so it's a fairly dumb model. If I go like minus 65. Yeah, so that's essentially what X-Plane does. So it's literally just a linear ramp between whatever it sees over here for the proper pulse temperature and whatever it has set up here for sea level. I don't know if it's whatever else in development, I'm not sure. Sort of, yeah. So we're turning on our course to there, to what do, they, what do they call that place? Grana. Our Grana is at 210 for speed. The funny story, we're going to have to actually decelerate pretty hard to get down there. I'm stand by. Uh, We've got about um, three minutes to Grana, so I'm going to take a quick bathroom break. I'm just going to leave the simulator running here. You go go ahead and you know enjoy your enjoy the sights. I'm going to switch this over to flight plan status mode, and you can watch the thing just fly itself for a couple of minutes. I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere.
Okay, back in the saddle, and I think I figured it out. Let me show you. Yeah, 6.5 per kilometer for ISA. Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah. It's pretty much that number. Uh, it's not really the matter that the ISA deviation is or isn't 6.5. It's the matter. It's, a, it's about how X-Plane does it. So if I bring up here... Uh, that piece of software. So here's what X-Plane does. It's even dumber than you think it, it is. A lot of red. I didn't want to make you red. I want to make you white. I'm going to paint with red. I like painting with red. Here's the problem, essentially. Um, here's altitude. Call this the zero point. Um, switch over like that. Okay, so here's the tropopause altitude, TP. And x -plane essentially simply does this. It, let's say, here's your airport. Um, so, call this the reference value. You've given it a target value, right? So let's say this is at whatever, called airport degree Celsius. It knows it wants to go through this point. So this is its reference point. And it also knows it's tropopause target. So tropopause degree Celsius, it knows that. And so it basically just does a linear ramp right through there. This is what you read off the sea level data ref. This is what you read off the tropopause data refs. And it just does a linear interpolation between those. Now that would be fine. The problem is, the problem is it doesn't adjust the TP temperature if you adjust this. So if you change this, say for instance, you push, you know, you say that, okay, no, today at my airport, it's minus 10 C. It still leaves the TP at the same value. So it just steepens up that curve and you end up with something like that. So that is why I was confused when we were in here, uh, when we were in the simulator, yeah, that is bad. <laughs> so I think, so here's a trick. Um, it, it's not entirely stupid. It's, it's just not complete. It's the problem is it relies on some weather add-on modifying this curve, modifying both the upper value. So it needs to push somebody, whoever's setting weather needs to push this value down as well, such that you get the sort of, still the same lapse rate. So the slope of this curve, that is your lapse rate, right? So this angle here, that is your temperature lapse rate. Um, and so it relies on somebody be, having enough widths to go and adapt that. But if you don't, if you just use the stock weather setting, it just does this. Um, later on the approach after a big turn, the VNAV speed seems to be commanding 200 knots when the target is 160. Uh, yes. Um, you talk about how the aircraft is anticipating speed reduction. So the 200 knots is because of honestly a bit of an oversight on my part. It won't, uh, let me think. I've actually not really tested the cases for sub 200 knots. So we're sort of targeting 200 knots because it thinks, they're, okay, we're coming up to the final approach fix. I'm just going to target 200 and just call it a day. Um, I need to check whether it's actually going to slow down below 200. In the code, it's probably not coded to do that. So I got to check that. No, honestly, the Challenger, it's it's not that well managed beyond into the approach phase. So it's not like an Airbus where it'll literally just go ahead and, you know, tie your shoes and, and I guess, uh, you know, drive your kids to school on, for you. Um, it, it does involve after the after the point there, after essentially committing, commencing the approach, uh, you do need to take a little bit more manual charge. I need to check whether we could actually tie, tidy that up. We probably could. It's not that big of a deal. So, get you down to like 17K. Not start weather extreme when. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I need to check. Like, that might actually just be a dumb thing on my part. So, don't take that to mean anything. That could very well be something that I messed up. 
So yeah, there's a big turn in this approach. Ooh, swoop and turn like that. Top of descent, one minute away. So I've armed the system for descent. So I've basically set the altitude pre-selector down. If I didn't, if I left this here at 30,000, path mode is gonna disarm and it's not gonna descend. But if I do this, if I set it lower, it will arm path mode and will come down on a vertical path descent. We'll leave it like that. And we should hear, should hear a boop boop there. Are the IRSs misaligned or is that my pressure simulation? Oh, IRSs are pretty good, so that's probably the pressure simulation system or something. Or I don't know. Why does it drop pause in the sim? Is it dynamic? Pilsner, you can adjust it. So it's settable, it's not dynamic. Um, I don't think X-Plane has data for it in its stock engine, uh, weather engine. However, you can change where it is. So if I change it up to 12,000 meters, I can do that. And it does change the temperature slope then. No, it isn't. Uh, y y you can change it, you can move it. So I think it's more a matter of like, they're just relying on uh, whatever weather engine you're using, basically doing the setting for you because otherwise it's just not gonna take care of it. I don't think it does anyway. We can actually check that. So it's gonna be, it's gonna make the airplane a little bit unhappy, but um, We've got here our tropopause altitude and setting for temperature. I'm just going to leave those as they are. And we're going to weather <clears throat> match real world. Download complete. Rock and roll. Unpause. And as you can see, they haven't changed at all. So, yeah. Ooh. Temperature is very different <laughs> from what I had here. <clears throat> yeah, it's basically plus 11 degrees Celsius at Sion, not minus 30, <laughs> as I had before. And there's a wind, there's a lot of wind there. Well, wind up here at higher altitudes, not down low. INSs are kind of fine, they're not misaligned or anything, so literally it, this is real wind up my butt. So yeah, explain simply, that's, that's why your ISIS go down to nothing because it doesn't change the tropopause target and it doesn't change the tropopause altitude. It just does a linear ramp between them. I could use, uh, that'll match the atmosphere of X-Plane for temperature. I have a solution, you won't like it at all. But does it involve me writing a new weather engine? Because if yes, then you're correct. I won't like that very much. You know? So index progress page, high 22 feet, 24 feet, slowly lowering the nose. Pull the skewed chart for the local area around the airport, around the plane that has temperature and dew point and pressure. What's a skewed T chart? If you have that, I could modify the X-Plane weather, I guess. It's the thing, I'm not in the business of making a weather engine. 
That's, so that's kind of annoying. But I guess I could, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Feels worked out pretty well. We're we still got about an hour and 25 minutes of fuel on board. Almost an hour and a half. And we're already in the approach. We're going to be about on down on the ground in about 10 minutes or so. So, give or take, we've got about an hour of reserve. Mastering the skewt. Ah. Christina, I've never heard of that. I mean, I'm not very good at... Oh. Huh. 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 Six cloud tops, icing, turbulence levels. Okay. 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 That I'm actually interested in. I, you got me in, intrigued. Where do I get that, though? Can we pull the data out of it? My temperature inverters mean more than fog. Manual for the ski T part Java tool part two. How to make pinpoint predictions with some potential. Okay. Uh, where do I get data for it? I love this guy though. He's got the best mustache. This guy's got pure aviation written all over him. Cool. FAA. Park surroundings. Okay, okay. Noah does have that. Good stuff. Interesting, interesting. We're going to take a look at this. Good stuff. Rock surroundings. In the sim here, while we're still flying, we're going to arm only LNAV arm RMP. Um, the procedure is a... The procedure is... An RMP barrel zero point three, good stuff. <clears throat> hmm. Interesting data. Lovely stuff you got here. Decades old pearl, most likely. Uh, there's a very good chance that it is. If it's Pearl, then it's already way more advanced than it has to be for her to pass um, government muster. All the surroundings and a rapid refresh. I mean, her. Sure. And why, why did you think that this is not going to be something I like? I you know, love pulling data. Pulling more data is, is always more better. I mean, you're talking to the guy who did the simulation of this crappy thing, and that that we are reading off the charts. So, UNH is one zero one two. So, essentially the same thing. BGP. Okay, final approach speed should be one sixty. And to slow down much below 200, it's going to actually need some flaps or some health because I think it ain't going to slow down much be much below about 200 knots with no flaps, especially not on a descent. I mean, on your level, sure. But wacky Pearl CGI scripts. All right, this needs uh, JavaScript or something. What is that? Rapid refresh. Okay, so what if some? Yeah, that's the thing. Is is what about somebody else doing stuff to the aircraft? Twenty twenty. Yeah, give or take. Uh, VNAF setup. No, not that. I want to go to Earth. Perf menu approach. It's what was it again? The temperature there is I think plus ten. Eleven. Eleven degrees. 
I don't know, actually, since I'm running real weather, I actually can put in wins. That's essentially nothing, so it's 1 0 0 at 3. That's basically nothing. 3 knots of tailwind. And we're gonna land with Cal Anti Ice on. Actually, no, we're not. Through that, no, we're not. I'm gonna land just with 10th stage bleed. Wow, that HUD is not very poppy coming through all those white clouds. Might be a little bit hard to see anything through there. How are we looking on the barometric corrections? Yeah, I mean, we're essentially at um, almost ice temperature, so there's very little difference. You've seen me do an RMP approach a number of times already, plenty of times, so it's really nothing new for you guys here. This is just us watching the airplane drive itself down. You could do things like, you know, get your fleet, your reversers on, get your pack or, or APU running for the approach and all that good stuff. All the boring stuff that we all know and love. And Graham remarked very, very accurately is that coming into here, it'll be a shitload of turbulence. Coming off those mountains, absolutely. A lot of it. I th yeah. This round is a rapid refresh. Here's the problem, though, Captain Crash, is even if I change the X plane atmosphere. What if somebody else is trying to change it? Or, or what if I change it in a way that isn't compatible? Like, what if they do want to run custom weather? Runway constraint. So there is no more descent constraints all the way down to runway, which, for whatever reason, somebody decided that calling a GS-617 is going to be the right way to go. So that's what they call it. GS-617. We've got our approach speeds and we've even got a th third cdu so we could you know watch the vertical deviation on here we've got cds to to play around with for weeks this is a this is an expensive option on the real aircraft if you want to have a three fms installation that is a substantial amount of extra money because it requires a third uh a third irs installed as well think yeah i don't think they offer it as a separate option so you'd have to pay extra money for that and we have rf rmp ar approach support with radius to fix legs and all the good stuff so that is an extra chunk of money that you gotta pay a fairly substantial amount of money for that software unlock that's really just software and that HUD ain't doing anything for me. I'm just gonna turn you on and get you out of the way. Wait. We can do like, I don't know, sit down here and be looking at our little instrumenty things. What did I push? You can watch down here, you can watch it like this. I got a 4K screen here, so I gotta actually pop it out so be able to see it because otherwise it's teeny tiny. That's what I said you, you won't like it, but the only way to force the Atma to match any kind of reality would be to pull a skew T, use the data to either compute row or something else. It would be three with other weather engines. I mean, we could. Here's a problem though. What if it's not really the matter of like screwing with other weather, weather engines? Um, we could quite easily, you know ignore them and run our own thing so that's already what i'm doing for so for example the engine sim simulation here is using already my modified uh my modified pressure right so 
the engine simulation here is also pressure aware on the inlet and all the other stuff because it's all hooked up into the same physics engine inside of my aircraft. But the problem is, what if the user wanted to set something custom? I don't want to be forcing everybody to be running real weather all the time. What if they want to run a different pressure, different pressure profile? We could detect if X-Plane is set to run with real weather. And if it is, that is a setting we could see. Or if they're running, I don't know. Well, for add-ons, it's a little bit difficult. Oh, by the way, set your minimums and all that good stuff. Um, don't have my charts handy, so I'm just going to try and remember what Graham had said. He had, like, I don't know, 37. Yeah, 3,700 feet, something like that. I don't remember anymore. Good stuff. LPV, or required navigational performance, sorry, sorry not LPV, RMP 0.3, since we're on the final approach legs, they're all coded for 0.3, or otherwise if, it, if they are not coded that way, we automatically go to 0.3 anyway, so it makes no difference. Final approach speeds are all set, 160 down to the runway. Temperature minus three, so I've got the cowl anti ice going. Ooh, there we go. Into the suit we go. Notice, by the way, that the engine, even though you've got, ooh, got some stuff coming onto the wind chill as well. Interesting. Notice, though, that it actually takes a little bit of time for the cowl anti ice here to. Damn, why was it so hot? I didn't turn you on. What the hell's happening here? Oh, right, that's the duct. I'm an idiot here. The cow actually takes a fair amount of time to warm up. So, to be honest, the biggest issue with no SQT is that they use degrees Fahrenheit. EP ignore or whatever X plane does and call it a day. Mm, well, no, because then you don't have a need to change anything. If you're going just by standard atmosphere stuff, then you're almost going to have the same temperature, same corrections, everything. I mean, that's what essentially I've got going right now. I don't know. We'll think about this. I'll, I'll land this thing and then we'll think about it sort of with the code editor open. Okay, turn is starting. Yeah, on this city here that I got my vertical aviation, cross track, zero, wind, almost none. My sound muted, so I have no idea what you're talking about. You're flying a seal properly means training off ASXP. I'll gladly do so. Oh, no, don't worry about it. I was wondering, by the way, it looks weird. You got minus one space there. Oh, by the way, we're out of the low temperature region. So these guys can come off. Notice the temperature here actually for the ITT goes up when you turn on the anti-ice because it actually takes bleed. So there we go, LSGS indicated there on the synthetic vision. So that tells us all well, the airports up ahead. Still fairly far though. See, within 10 miles of the airport, we get the extended runway center line. So we can go ahead and start configuring for the final approach. So gear down, flap sturdy. Normally you wouldn't figure quite this early, but you get a point. 
fairly steep approach. And actually pull text from each plot. Oh, neat. And let's go to final config. Flaps 45. And let's go to... So VREF is 121, so let's go VREF plus 5. We've got some amount of tailwind, so we don't need to add any headwind component. It's wandering a little bit there because of the fact that it has to like do a large trim change. With the Flaps 45, there's a large trim change, very large pitch change, so the airplane will wander a little bit on the approach, but generally will pull itself back in. Get some heads up display goodness going. And are we actually visual by minimums? Well, we're visual way earlier than that, so I've already got the runway in sight there. So those things are all under control. There's minimums. At this point, it's just monitoring. We're getting a coffee. I don't know. One of those things. I don't, I'm not a pilot. So, well, I am a pilot, but I'm not that kind of a pilot. Oh, right. Uh, if I wasn't a, a bad pilot, I would have gone ahead and transferred over the packs onto the APUs, which you're normally supposed to be doing here. Got field elevation correct. Close enough anyway. Oh, 1600. Yeah, pretty close. I mean, it will normally automatically pressurize a little bit below field elevation. So about 200 feet low is what normally automatically pressurizes to. So final config, you can see it's given us a 3.6 degree pitch mark. So the, so the HUT computer, the heads up guidance computer, actually pulls that data from the uh, arrival data section here. So it does know the glide path angle. That's why it's given us a pitch ladder there. It's gone into declutter mode, so it's removed the HSI from the display there. We're in final config, so it's in landing config gear down, flaps 45, and we're below 1,500 feet elevation on radio altimeter. That means HUD automatically goes to declutter mode. Autopilot off. We can go ahead and kill the flight director. Auto throttle off. I'm gonna sync up my throttles here, and at this point it's all in the hands, baby. And I'm lazy here, so I'm just driving it. Well, it should be a little bit higher, so just give a smidge more power. There, just lining up that 3.6 degree mark with the touchdown zone. Normally, you know, swing over and then back onto the runway. You were a good pilot. I'm not a good pilot, so I don't have to do that. And rock and roll. Idle power. Don't bend the plane like me. <laughs> Man, that was a bad one. <laughs> oh, that was a crappy landing. I think nobody's taking notes. Just a small bounce. That was a pretty bad one. Where do we park here? Left, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> I guess left again. Sure, why not? Who cares? And in usual challenger fashion, since uh, we are at low weight, thing just wants to fly away from us. Notice that. Look over here on the HUD. Stow speed brakes. 
flaps up, reversers disarm. That goes away, that goes up there. And it heats off. It's already at six knots and it's still accelerating. Seven knots. And I've got my thrust at idle. I'm not trying to push here. Just keeps on speeding up. There's a lot of idle thrust. And this is not even at sea level. At sea level, it's even faster. Last 10 feet are tricky. Yeah, yeah. You're either slamming it in or the friggin' thing just uh, wants to float forever. It's, 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 it's a tricky thing to land, for sure. Pretty airplanes. There's a lot of pretty airplanes down here. I mean, there are some ugly ones, but a couple of pretty ones, so. <clears throat> Let's turn in here, pretend that's the FPO or something. Vision jets all over, yeah. Hey there. I'm not gonna stand next to those though. Again, there's a truck there. I'm just gonna block them all in. Oh my god. Why is the dude backing up? Sure. Yeah. That one you want on. You want these off. Or whatever. And not really how you're supposed to do any of this, but you know, don't look at me for guidance. And transponder off. Rock and roll. Perfect. Cool stuff. Uh, how are we looking for engine temperatures? Just for funsies. Exhaust duct is heating back up because we're basically stopped pushing air through there. So kind of warm up quite good. Oil system is yeah, plenty cool enough. That's fine. 300 degrees on the, on the engine core is standard temperature. And you're gonna see these ITTs are gonna start creeping up again. As the engine basically comes to a full stop, the core is just going to re, uh, re-energize with heat coming off there, off of the heat hot core there. So the ITT probes are now going to start climbing back up. Good stuff. Is the engines even are the engines even going to completely stop? I mean, my, 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 they will windmill provided there is enough wind there. Two knots might just about be enough to keep them slowly rolling about, but that might not be enough. Two knots is barely one meter per second. Let's see. Actually, we don't even need both packs. That's kind of overkill. They might just slowly turn over. This is very little wind, barely a breeze. And the IRUs have probably re-entered alignment mode, haven't they? Yes, sir, they have. Time to nav is indicated. That means it's systems have initial re-initialized back into alignment mode. Here's our GPS status, SBAS PA, even though we didn't use precision approach for SBAS at all, but we have it. We need it. Yeah, Agnos coverage is going to be 
reasonably good. Obviously, because we're in Switzerland, so we're pretty much smack back and smack dab in the center of it. Right there. Good stuff. Nah. It's too little wind to even get the engines turning. Yeah, no, they're going to stop completely. Engine core, the core is already stopped because, well, the core stops first. But yeah, this boy ain't turning over. Not even able to overcome the static friction of the rotor there. Need a little bit more wind. Just a touch. Cool. So let's switch over to full screen mode and let's go and mess about with code. Enough messing about with the plane. Trying to mess around, trying to mess around with the code. So what are we gonna do for or with this thing? Hmm. Do we adjust? Do we follow X plane? Do we not? Do we fix X plane? I mean, there are many ways to sort of in this cat. So, what do we do? We can ignore X plane. We could do this, which is what I'm doing right now, by the way. So, that's essentially. Well, sort of what I'm doing right now. Not quite. Yeah, essentially what I'm doing right now. Question, is it, is it correct? We'll catch you up later. Have a good one. Thanks for sharing the flag for proper simulation. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, I'm a nerd. I'm, I'm just as much of a sim nerd as everybody else in here in this chat, so... It's more a matter of like making my ideal plane for myself. Have a good one, man. Uh, so what do we do here? We give X plane the finger. Do we follow X plane? Do I? Yeah. And I don't want to be doing the charts. Um, the problem there is essentially that rough chart, you see Java plots. So you're talking about, so the question is though, this probably does not have data for where there are in the airports. So actually this would not really help us at all for, for other places around the planet. So if you were somewhere you know, over the ocean or something that would not actually do anything. Um, the only data that we have reliably is whatever's in the SAM. Um, Unfortunately, the way x -Plane does it right now, as we figure it out, is, is just straight up dumb. Because as we've computed before, I had... Uh, what was it? Oh, I had it over here. All right, it was minus 51 at sea level. And minus 56.5, I think is what it was targeting. No, minus 51 at my flight altitude... Right, my, and mine 26 at sea level, minus 56.5 or whatever was is what it was targeting for the proper pause, uh, like that. So it was basically doing a 30 degree, so less than a degree temperature elapse rate. That's just not doable. I don't know if QT provider outside of the continental US. All nerds in here. Yes, Don X, exactly. You're you're just by proven by being able to listen to me without falling asleep, you've proven your nerdiness beyond any reproach. Um Yeah. That's the thing is, is I could I could 
you know, come up with something. I'm okay with Nerdin. Basically, it's saturated lap trade. No, 1.5 is a saturated lap trade. 1.0 is something crazy. The saturated lap trade is, where are you? Um, saturated lap trade is 1.5 per thousand. And you give people the two choices. I could, yeah, sure, why not? Hmm. Or we could follow whatever is said and explain. <sighs> True it. We're gonna we're gonna ignore whatever explain Scott said for Tropo setting and do a standard lap trade for simulation because that is more correct i guess and uh, we're going to aim for i'm already happy with this interpolation system that i've got going here where we're going for some sort of a reference base value for the q and h correction then i'm correcting the q and h determining the p0 value at c level and from there we just go by standard lap trade you're going to get uh, whatever you're going to get um for temperature or for the altimeter reading, I guess. Um, what I count, there's no global system or global data coverage. So go with ISO. Yeah, that's the thing. And it's, I guess, if it's such a problem for people that are flying online, they're, I'm going to make it a toggle where you can go to like, I accept that I've basically broken the temperature correction system and uh, just for consistent altitudes, whatever, I'm going to do that. But could I override that? Not really, I think. See, the thing is, I think that these guys, the, the, the network add-ons, they're reading your geometric altitude and considering that to be your pressure altitude, it's just sending that out. If... No, they can't. Oh, they, they'd have to basically fix their own shit. Because uh, even if we somehow simulated such that you would actually send out the correct elevation data to them, they would not be sending the correct elevation data to you. They'd just appear at whatever. Um, so, yeah, we just have to go deal with that. So, you fly online, you're not happy with what, what it's going to present there. Um... Yeah, whatever. How would this affect altimeter readings when dealing with terrain? Ah, that's the thing. It would affect them very significantly, as I said before. Let's set new standards here. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but I kind of doubt people are going to follow what I'm doing. Kind of, you know, I understand the reality of it is that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be the trendsetter here unless there's ma major consensus. Yeah, that's the thing is, is, for terrain clearance, that's really the thing why you're doing it in the first place, right? Ran into issue that you have in from a slightly different angle. Humidity has an effect on atmospheric row. How to determine how much humidity is affecting the density? Of the, right. Yeah, I've got that same problem in the set of the Challenger. It's not that big of a deal. For you, it is. For me, it isn't. Um, yeah. How do you do? How do you deal? How do you deal with that? Um, what well, I'm thinking about, though, for indications on the avionics. Hmm. Do I override the X-plane atmosphere? What other temperature data riffs are available instead of X-plane? Temperature. Sure, whatever. It's going to be in the weather section. Sim weather. Temp. Attempt, sure. Temperature sea level, temperature tropopause, temperature ambient, temperature leading edge, and that is it. Nothing more. Oil temperature, that's just enunciators at this point. So we're outside of that section where it's actually making any sense. Let me just reformat it so you can actually read it. 
So yeah, these are the only this is the only piece of data that we have. Dew point sea level, relative humidity, sea level percent. But we got wave data for some reason. Um, that's really important. Um, wave amplitude in EA in EH what? That just badly arc. It's just badly aligned line there. Yeah, good question. So what do we do here? Sheer direction, this wind stuff, that's wind stuff. These are the only things that we got. Um, and rewriting this would require that we modify, well, x would have to basically have a new weather engine, which we know ain't happening. So, yeah, we're gonna work with whatever we got. Um, we're just gonna leave it there for the Static pressure simulation. Am I going to modify the temperature simulation or am I going to modify the static pressure according to the TLR? Oh. Here's a question. If we, what if we just follow whatever x -plane does? Would that actually work? If let's say x -plane had that dumb data in it. So minus 51 at a current altitude. That comes out to a temperature lapse rate. So we're that. No, it's minus minus 56.5 standard. So 29.66 divided by 11 kilometers. That is a super low, 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 low temperature lapse rate, but whatever, we'll we'll take it. Let's have a look. Here is our little experimental thing. Get rid of this data. I don't need you. Go away. Yeah, I can stay. Whatever. Temperature lapse rate. So if this is not that, if it's this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Let's simplify this. I'm going to make a couple of plots here. That's Premier, right? Yes. I'm going to make a couple of plots here. So this is using all these standard parameters. So make a couple of lines above this. And then we're going to go for another one. This line actually I don't give a shit about. So let's use the dumb plot here and go press. Uh, so this is pressure at, at whatever standard lapse rate. So pressure PA. And it's going to use actually. So I'm going to change you over. So did you always use column A? That way I'm going to be happy. Um, you go over there. And instead of B, you're gonna use B4. Instead of B2, you're gonna use B4 here. Boom, and copy you out there. Holy shit. Is that right? Did I use that correctly? That is off by miles. That would make your altimeter read absolutely garbage. That kind of explains why x -plane doesn't do it right. If we invert this, um, where's my handy little equation there? Bash that quickly in there. We invert this value, it'd be A7, or it's one minus pressure at the station. So A7 divided by 1013.25 to the power of 190.284. All that times, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, all of that times 145366.45. And I'm actually going to represent these as copy you out here. 
I'm just gonna make a representation of these as feet so that we got some aviation reference. So times 3.281. Boom, like that. And the plot here needs to be fixed. So here, the register. You're gonna go in. Holy crap, that's messed up. I'm gonna make a new one. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, sure. Insert chart. Line chart. Yeah, sure. Now it's two lines are roughly about the same ish. So this is now showing feet. So here's our tropopause 36099. Close enough. And now if I go and do not a seven, but D seven. This is gonna be in feet. Hang on. Is it? Pressure at the station. Divide by that crap. Oh my god, I got a bad thing there. No, I was right. One minus D seven divide by that chunk there. That to the power of that crap. 1.45366.45. Do I have a mistake in there? I mean, obviously I do. Oh, right. Like that. And I do actually want to show leading zeros. So, uh, format cells, leading zeros, and no decimals stuff. And holy shit balls. Yeah, this is complete bunk. So we cannot follow crap, discard all that crap down there. Relevant. Yeah, okay, so the X plane, so following X planes temperature gradient ain't gonna work. Because we'd end up with some stupid numbers. <sighs> we'd end up with 16,000 feet being read when it's actually at 40,000 feet. Okay. So that clearly will not work. Discard all of that. Go away. So it's going to copy you over and I'm going to make a separate 288.15 plus I said plus 20 will be a very high temperature. Hmm. What I could do though what I could do though is right. So what I'm doing here is essentially I'm estimating the, um, I'm looking at, let me see. What's my setting for T0? How do I determine T0? I think I just read the x -plane value, which is garbage. Yeah. T0C, yeah, so I'm just getting the x -plane var value, which is garbage for sea level temperature. Instead, what I could be doing is I would compute the T0 value from my present temperature, what I'm measuring, and compute my own ISO deviation from that, and then just generate a fake T0 value. Give x plane the middle finger, and uh, yeah, that way. Because at high altitudes, really, the ISO deviation is fairly small. It's not like, you know, when you're down at sea level, you can get ISO deviation plus 50, well, that's, a, that's a lot, but you know, ISO deviation plus 35. For T-standard stuff, you go to Vegas, pretty normal. Uh, they, they, they just call that a Tuesday. So rather than having the altimeter read garbage all the way up into your, your very high flight levels, C3, 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 there you are. 
rather than having your altimeter read giant deviations all the way up into high flight levels, so rather than 39,300, you'd read 35,000, we could compute a new T0 value from your present ISO deviation and work backwards. So if you're at ISO plus 20, which is high elevation, is very hot, um, you under you're under reading by only like two and a half thousand feet so b67 minus e67 you're under reading by two and a half thousand feet problem but not the end of the world um not as if you were at like plus 35 that's four and a half thousand feet over reading or under reading so that'd be bad plus 10 it's starting to look reasonable you know plus zero is obviously all right, that's just a little bit of inaccuracy. This this equation that I'm using for backwards transformation from the temperature is a little bit not quite right, but it's close enough. You know, 13 feet. It's, it's ain't, it ain't nothing. Uh, that's essentially nothing. But you know, plus five degrees ISA, not a big deal. Um, that's pretty standard stuff. So what we're gonna do instead. I'm going to work back from the current temperature back to T0. So, let's wrap that T0C value. So, T0C, do I even use that anywhere else? I don't. Perfect. So, we can just go bunk, bump it out of there. TS for static temperature. That is our current static temperature. Uh, I think I call it TS here as well. Right, TSC. TSC. Static temperature. And we know our true right AGL. We are no, we know our true elevation, which is over here in the elev field. So from there, I can work back what your T0 should have been. Um, TS and T0. T0 would have been TS minus, no, plus, yeah, ISO TLR per one meter multiplied by position elevation. And that's going to give us your original temperature value. Your, well, the virtual temperature value that will correspond to your current ISO deviation. Right. So let's say you're as this was in our test here, we were at minus 51.717. So minus 51.17, it was at 30,000 feet. Right. So that plus ISO TLR is 1.98 per thousand feet plus our elevation is 30. So it would have been plus eight. So 15 minus that junk is we were essentially well, the other way around minus 15 minus 6.77 C on the ISO deviation at that elevation. And that gives us a reasonable T zero value. You'll, you'll be able to actually you know, use that. Cool. And if you have a lower uh, or, or, or greater deviation, either way, it's going to work out fine. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We still get to use the same TLR slope. I think this will work. Opinions. Do let me know in the chat. And simple tweak. I like simple tweaks. And it even works with network network. Well, it doesn't quite work for net, net, network flight, but it does work with add ons. So if an add on manipulates the temperature data refs in X plane, this will work. It'll work fine. Cool. So now we get to actually compute or, or do the temperature compensation code. Ah, cool stuff. So this thing can go suck the big one. So what we've decided on doing is essentially, let's say that, and if you're up here, uh, no, you're up like here, you take that difference and then construct a new ramp from here down to ground level. 
and the error between your or your altimetry error is going to be essentially this area here well represented by whatever will be the difference between these two can't think of a better way than constraint model explain has yeah i mean the obvious best solution would be to just have the data for the entire vertical column right and the obvious best solution would be to have actual pressure the correct pressure but uh, short of that this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna go with yeah perfect stuff cool i'm happy that you're happy that everybody else is happy uh let's rock and roll on this here thing so how does this guy compensate for altimetry errors um he knows so you're asking yeah yeah, yeah. so basically it goes by off of iso deviation so it knows the field elevation for your airport you set an oat temp comp on or off cool stuff and what you do um next show temp comp blah 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 there's a bunch of disclaimers. Tempcom selected off. WPS still be displayed as 3.001. Tempcom selected on. I don't mean to increase the predicted performance corresponds. When the temperature compensation feature is on, the aircraft is within the terminal area for either the origin or destination airport, and an OAT is not entered at the airport. Check airport OAT. Good stuff. So that is something that we're going to have to check as well yellow e shows in yellow on a cd annunciation line check airport always is cleared when the temperature comes to turn it off or running your craft weight blah 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 sure so that's going to factor into the reference computer so that's going to be in the ref comp code because i'm pretty sure that when you set this temperature here um it's or this here OAT, it's the same value as you set on the um, arrival reference page and takeoff reference page. This is all part of the reference computer or performance computer stuff. So MSL altitude 12.3, correction 138, 12.438. Let's just check their math. Are they correct? If I'm using my math, honestly, if, if that's correct. So they sell, they, they say 12.3438. That's almost there. Um, let's see, they had ISO minus three. They're on that chart. So that'll be that minus three. 12.46. Computed altitude. All right, so it's pulling the, the correction in the opposite direction. Uh, let's just mess around with this until it reads, um, I can just go ahead and set this up like this. So 12,300 divided by 3.281. So it's that in many meters, that pressure, not pretty close, um, probably within the confines of my happy estimation function here what would be the actual proper inverse function mm -mm -mm -mm. to compute height we need to invert that multiply that or, or powers that powers that well first of all divide then take the power of inverted blah 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 okay now, this is the sort of stuff that i need a piece of paper for so like I can't do a whole uh, inversion of a function in my head. Do I just take this? Yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, P equals P zero multiply by. Okay, so it's gonna be P over P zero. This whole thing to the power of the inverse thing, uh, whatever, just do like that. To the power of the inverse of that, multi the exponent there. So it's gonna be R zero times L, and this is gonna be G times M. Then what that's gonna give us is one minus L times H over T zero. So we want to break out this piece here. 
right? Yes. So, the one minus all of that junk on the left is gonna give us this piece here. Uh, let's make it like that. One minus all of this junk over here. Masky art is fun. It's gonna give us this part. So now we gotta take and multiply the whole crap here on the left side by T0. That's gonna give us L times H. And like that, sorta. Pretend that's all correctly aligned. And we wanna take just that out of there. So all of that divide by L gonna equal to H. Folks, check my math. Anybody following along at home? I figured you would be. Do, 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 do. way a little bit neater looking did i get that inversion correct or did i completely mess it up i have to wait for a sec so i missed a part of it so this is the equation i'm trying to invert i mean it's essentially the same thing as this yeah this was well it's a little bit neater i guess not really It's gonna be essentially the same crap. I mean, it's gotta be, right? Mathematical identities, otherwise they wouldn't work. And math does work. Do, 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 do. I think that's correct. So if I pat, bash all of this into calc here, hopefully that'll come up with the right solution. So that's the estimator or approximator, approximator function. Let's make this just like that. And we'll go ahead and compare. <laughs> so divide by L is over here. So that'll be B2. And there's going to be a whole bunch of junk here on the left. And the junk on the left is going to be all multiplied by T0, which is C2. And then there's going to be one minus something in, in brackets. P divide, so it's D7 divide by P0, which is, I could have labeled my columns here, but a2 this to the power of a division g times m so g is d2 divide or multiply by m molar mass e2 there's a bunch of other junk there r0 which is the gas constant where's r0 f2 multiply by Lapse rate again, so B2. I could pre multiply that honestly. You know, if I did everything right, we should end up with some sort of a consistent. Holy crap! I didn't expect this to work on the first try, but apparently I did. So this is a meters. We can multiply this by. Yeah, usually nothing works for me for the first try, so I love accidental excellence. Um, purely by accident um cool um so that out of the way good stuff 
So that is the inverted function, and that gives us the accurate altitude measurement to within, you know, zero feet. Math, it works. Holy crap, yeah. That means I gotta go in here and to lib ACI fuels. Are, am I gonna modify this function? Yeah. Altitude to pressure NOAA, I think, or, or whatever I called it, or pressure to altitude. That was a shitty one. Here's the, um, here's the less shitty one. Here are this and, or do I, do I create a new one? Should I? Pressure to altitude, the correct one. Um, hmm. Nah, I'm going to create a, uh, got to be used inside of the ADC, inside of the air data computer. So Mr. A air data computer is going to use this one here. So through this, not that either. So, uh, hang on. This depends on a bunch of parameters. No, 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 this depends on a bunch of parameters that are don't, not part of this function's input. So this would basically be a assume. Okay, no, no, no. I'll make a new one and we're gonna call this one pressure to altitude, whatever, um, to, <laughs> well, I'll make something up, something better. Um, so there's gonna be a P parameter for pressure. Yeah. There's going to be a P0 for reference pressure rather than Q and H. Q and H is dumb. Um, then there's going to be a parameter for gravitational acceleration. Molar mass of dry air. Are we going to just use the standard one? Yeah, we're going to use a standard one. P0. P0 is absolutely going to be a part of the inputs. Universal gas constant is fixed. So, yeah, we're going to use this guy here. And pressure at altitude no uh, the blah and is gonna be implemented in terms of pressure to altitude two uh press P zero we all oh, we refer to it as Q and H so that then earth gra standard gravity and ISA SL temp K I think is what what I called that. I see if you little perf. I saw SL temp K. Yeah, good stuff. Earth gravity, standard stuff. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And go over here. Return. So, so because temperature corrections are done based Temperature at and height above aerodrome. To be able to insert the corresponding air, you need to determine the elevation of the aerodrome. Yes. Yes. Is zero to hence the reference selection algorithm. And you need to figure out a better way to account for temperature lapse or for current altitude to the aerodrome. Yes. In other words, my standard kind of set of problems. First, I got to break a system and then I got to go fix a system. I, but I got to break it in a way that is realistic and then fix it in a way that is realistic so it's really kind of double the work <laughs> okay uh so it's going to be p over p0 well let's make a couple assumptions here <laughs> first off we want to make sure that p0 is or not is greater than zero this will work for p equals zero for space how strange that might sound what what is it going to indicate there, though? Something weird. Yeah, this, this is definitely still an estimator algorithm, so it's not actually a, a completely super duper highly accurate thing, but it's close enough. It only took me like five hours to figure that out. Yes, uh, pretty much. That's, uh, that's exactly what we're going for here. Um, cool. 
Can I get some more tea, please? No? Am I? Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, R0, R0, R0. So that is the universal gas constant. That's not going to change. Standard temperature lapse rate. Uh, yeah, welcome to the party. Time for tea and biscuits as a treat. I wish you hadn't didn't show up. Explain, explain guts are frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Especially, have you started using actual correct magnetic headings yet, Captain Crash? Or are you not uh, yet in that part of the avionics code for the Hindenburg? I mean, do we even call it avionics? Is it ship avionics for an airship? I'm still trying to make this thing fly. Okay, yeah, cool. But if you do want to make, if you do want to use correct um, magnetic info, then not explain. I mean, then again, depends on what you want to simulate, right? If you're trying to simulate what it would have been, oh, WMM is totally going in there. Okay, cool. Um, but I mean, then again, if you're going to be simulating what it, what it was like, like in 1936, um, who cares at that point? what the magnetic declination is going to be. <laughs> you don't have to, it's not like you're going to be flying instrument approach procedures with the thing. <laughs> I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you do. You do you. I'm absolutely not going to argue against that. That is absolutely worth it. So T zero has to be greater than zero. And gravity hopefully is greater than zero. Uh, gravitational acceleration has to be greater than zero. Everything else is okay there. Rock and roll. So, so it's going to be the power function of P over P0, and it's going to be R0, so R universal, multiplied by the ISA, what I call it, ISA TLR, ISA TLR per one meter, ISA temperature lapse rate per one meter, and uh, it's going to be multiplied by G times the molar mass of dry air, dry air mole. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so that multiplied by T0. Thank, yeah, something like that. Hmm, thank you. Lovely stuff. Got to get got to keep well hydrated. Is there a WMM from 1930? Uh, you're probably going to have to make one up. You just might, you know, just the thought. Am I going to pile all of this into one expression? Sure. Why not? Uh, I don't like it. Make it makes a big difference. Um, that and that whole thing divided by the ISO TLR per 1,000 meters and wrap it all nicely up, put a little bow on it and actually put a comment about what the hell it's trying to do. I'm gonna use the current database since people will want to fly online. Uh, yeah, uh, I suppose they might, uh, although with the Hindenburg, um, it's not like they're gonna really <laughs> mingle with a lot of traffic, with a lot of airship traffic. Oh, well, they might. Hmm. Could have probably closed my my email stuff there. Stand by. Got some emails here. What the hell? Good stuff. And that you know, was So, where are we? I still got that piece of shit running. Oop, no, I don't want to close you. Oop, mistook you, sorry, sorry. Oh, we're back online. Okay, so looking at that equation, if P0 is equal to zero, then is rid of the power of X, so. Yeah, zero to the power of whatever is 
undefined, isn't it? Zero to the power of... No. No. It's zero. What? All right. So it'd be zero to the power of whatever is going to be zero, one minus that T zero over L. So T zero over L, but that's going to be, which would be something like 288.15 divided by 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 6, 5, 44,000 meters. I think, right? Check that. So this is the barometric altimeter equation, but invert it to solve for, oh, this is just the barometric altimetry equation, is it? Uh, barometric formula. Yeah, sure. The barometric formula solve for H. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just going to copy that because I like putting equations in my stuff. Who doesn't like a little bit of ASCII equation, equation ASCII art? Like that one minus... P over P zero. Yuck. Keep the fact that it's not aligned, but whatever. I have to deal with that. And all of this here raised to the power of G times M R zero times L. And all this junk closed up, multiplied by T zero. And so H that stuff, perfect stuff, where P is current pressure, outside pressure, whatever. P0 is the refer reference sea level pressure. Not QNH. R0. The universal gas constant l would be r uh, l is the temperature i said temperature or oh, temperature lapse rate really temperature lapse rate g is gravitational gravitational acceleration which by the way i do vary <laughs> That's why I made it an input here. Um, so if you do have, so there was a paper I read a while ago. Well, not a while ago, it was a day. But it was a nice paper which was talking about the fact that um, that there are altimetric errors, barometric altimeter errors induced by the fact that the model the model was developed at temperate latitudes, so it basically assumes a sort of average G value here. But if you're high up in the poles or down low near the equator, gravity does actually change strength because of the fact that there's a little bit of a deformation in the Earth, and you've got your you're effectively closer or further away from the body, or from the mass, uh, from the surface of the mass of the Earth, right? So therefore. Since gravity changes as the square of distance, there is an appreciable slight 
to be more exact. Will my lift equation pull the local G? Uh, X plane, I don't think actually understand local G. Are you pulling G from live ACF utils or from X plane? The X plane only, I think, has one fixed value for all the planet. Okay, cool. Good man. Uh, molar mass of dry air. P0 is your uh, reference sea level temperature in Kelvin. We're going to put on units. Yeah, sure we are. Pascals, reference sea level pressure, Pascals. Well, these do divide up, so who cares what they're, what units they are. Universal gas constant is, I think, think dimensionless if I remember right no no it isn't is it, is it? no it isn't um now you'll find I think I had the units up here uh, the joules per mole kilogram joules per mole kelvin there we go not kilogram temperature elapse rate is kelvin per meter I think I had it PLR Kelvin per meter. All the physics computer externally, except for where I need to pull the atmospheric rho and OAT. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Good, good idea. Well, I'm computing my own rho at this point because I'm changing the pressure. Yeah, I'm effectively changing the pressure with the with the aircraft's sensing on the sensors. Should I be changing the Simulator pressure. Make it match flight behavior. I could. There is some change. But at that point, I'm losing kind of a reference point because I'm using the pressure to... Am I? Hang on. Does this code depend on pressure at all? Height, AGL. No, it doesn't actually. I mean, it computes pressure, right? P0 is the airport reference value. As you will induce an error. Um, yeah, but the problem is at this point, that would be messing with weather. And there I would be overriding whatever a plugin might be doing. So there is that flip side. Ugh. If somebody's got a crappy weather add-on, you know, they might not understand the fact that they need to change some stuff, but whatever. I'd rather not break break not breaking compatibility is, is kind of pretty high on the list. Uh meter per second squared. Molar mass of dry air. Ugh. Kilograms per mole, right? I never remember what molar mass is in terms of units. Good stuff. Hmm, yeah. Kelvin per meter. Kelvin's divide up. You end up with a meter. Yeah. Cool. Amazing, isn't it? Um, disregarding what the exponent here does, that's probably basically just a sort of hand-picked correction factor. All the unit dimension... So you know you're from your school dimensional analysis. Uh, so these guys end up as a dimensionless quantity because you divide the same units. So this is a dimensionless quantity, dimensionless quantity. This definitely has a dimension, that's temperature. But this is temperature per meter. So you end up with, effectively, uh, Kelvin over 1 over Kelvin over meters and dimensional dimensional analysis is happy because you're going to end up with uh, these two canceling out and then to form you know the combined fraction you're going to end up with the outside on the top and the inside on the bottom so you're just going to end up with meters amazing math is great how can people not love it Perfect.
Good stuff. Um, altitude pressure two. Uh, called Barrow. Yeah, sure. Very descriptive. Um, sure. And for the NOAA one, we have essentially corrected it. You use standard Earth gravity, isocea level temperature K, UNH, and pressure. And therefore, we've ended up with the standard IKO aircraft parametric equation. And this should probably be deprecating this junk. The old one. Hang on, is that actually the correct one? Am I re-implementing something? Meters to feet. No, this is using universal gas constant. I mean, it's close. Right, 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 right. Yeah, this is basically the thing. Yeah, it's basically the same thing as this one, except it's got a bunch of constants shoved in there where you normally have the possibility of changing stuff so here we go yeah t0 yeah it's essentially the same uh, fuck me uh, i've solved the same equation again um let's put t0 over here um t0 over there yeah it's essentially the same thing t0 times one minus pressure over P zero to the power of more abstraction, more better. Yeah, that's in this case, it's more like more crap. Um, yeah, universal gas constant times temperature lapse rate times gravity divided by or times dry air mole mass divided by temperature lapse. Rate. Fuck me. It's exactly the same thing. I've just whatever. Um, so easy peasy lemon squeezy now I can just go ahead and implement it as the same thing pressure to altitude barrow I can just use the same function again but I'm gonna pass in a bunch of bunch of constants pressure Q and H earth gravity and <laughs> yeah that's essentially the same thing and the good thing is I don't think anybody else is using this equation this is currently only using my code probably So I can go ahead and shove this thing down the tube. It's the same to code. Fuck that thing. Um, yeah, do that. Barrow, barrow, barrow. Is that enough abstraction? E equals stuff. Is that enough? Pressure to altitude. Altitude pressure is probably broken and I don't care. Uh, okay, needs uh, a more varied set of input parameters. There we go. E, P, zero, G, and T, zero. Good stuff. Did I use capital P or lowercase p? I never can make up my mind of whether I want to call pressure with a capital P or a lowercase p. T. Ah, uh, yeah. That's the good stuff. Let's make a quick build. Test if I didn't break anything. Apparently I didn't. Not enough anyway. And rebuild this pile of junk. Yeah, okay, there we go. CPC is already broken, so... Source now ECS cabin pressure control 327 and uh feet to meters. What the hell is going on in my, in my head there? Might have been a source of a bug. Pressure to altitude, actually. Oh, hang on. Lib ACF field source. This was written back in my dumb days when I didn't. Uh, yeah, that's the difference here. Is this was written back in my dumb days when I was using feet and meter feet well, and aviation units all over the friggin' place. So, 
maintain backwards compatibility with the code. Eh, whatever, I guess. Uh, I guess this is what we're doing here. Um, yeah, meters to feet, and then everybody else can go ahead and convert back feet to meters. And like that. Fizz get PS. Eh? Wait a second, where the hell did you get that value? This is, well, right. The CPC has its own pressure sensing port. It's got its own static port. <laughs> Rather than reading it directly, you should probably do a little bit of filtering on the input there, mate. But close enough. For now, you'll you'll do. Um, Three degree, pressure to altitude, feet to, feet to meters. Yeah, okay. There we go. PL21, air data computer, 615. Discard that junk. Air data computer, 616. That yeah, crap. Feet to meters, pressure to altitude, no. Huh? Okay, that's the only other case here. Then we got it in the A in the display system. One six five eight. Normally bearer altitude update. Okay. <laughs> sure. Might be another one there. Uh, subsystem position. Well, IAPS FMC subsystem position. This guy is going to go 1172. And that's all of them. <clears throat> Hopefully. Uh, huh. <clears throat> cool stuff. Um, and. Go into the top level here, fizz.c. So this guy here, this guy here, what are you doing? Uh, you're updating, updating, and updating, and altitude to pressure. Altitude to pressure. You can just make that part of low base of utils. Alt to press. ATM. This is the QNH correction parameter. Sure. <laughs> Barrow. Well, it actually doesn't need the tropopause value here. That doesn't factor in. For this, out to press. Barrow. I said TP altitude, so get rid of this. At most TP altitude is not gonna go in. Uh, right, there's one more. Barrow. Do I even need the tropopause altitude here? I mean, screw that thing. I just get it here. And we filter it in, we'll just discard the friggin' thing. So don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Easy. Easy, easy, easy stuff. That in hand. Let's go ahead and fly. Fly the friggin' thing. Re clean my state here and I'm not going to fly real world conditions. Instead, I'm going to go there. EPA, all this total bunk anyway. Yeah, that's true. So with this in hand, actually, is there somewhere really cold where we could just go and mess around?
it's northern hemisphere summer it's going to be colder down here somewhere maybe uh how did i pass by southern australia uh plus six not really okay we're gonna just have to make up our own don't we Forecast the 300 broke. Uh, there's a the temperature. Great again long. It reminds me of that Metarb decoder thing. Am I blind or did it not give a temperature? Oh, it's six degrees. Okay. Okay, never mind that. We'll make our own then. Rock and roll. Make our own weather. Sion will. Do sure who gives a crap. Uh, we'll make our own weather. We'll start at manually configured. Uh, huh? There's some wind. Sure, I guess. Go away. Let's go and do it. It's not going like that. It should go to standard settings. Or maybe it doesn't. Never mind. We'll, we'll pretend it's minus 30 at Sion, which is a it's it's in the Alps, so that would be kind of believable. Um, standard pressure, just to make sure that we've got as few variables we're testing here as possible. Rock and roll. <clears throat> got way too much height on this window. I'm on airplane. It's really not the airplane that's slow. It's it's kind of more explain itself, but rock and roll. Here we are. Sort of stuff. Just adjusting my view here, so I'm. My view is roughly what you guys can see, so I'm not accidentally you know, putting screens off the display or stream. Quickly time accelerate through that. APU starting. Whoa, Get a bug here. So what the hell did I break? Do, 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 max dev. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What? My instrument comparator broke? Well, that's a new one. I wasn't even aware that was a thing I could break. Okay, Mr. Icom, so what is your deal here? IDE max deviation function. Okay. So what is IDE info max deviation function? What are you pointing at? FCC altitude compar comparator max deviation. Okay, so this guy here, obviously I screwed something up. Uh-huh. It's going to be in the FCC code. C4006. Yes. Where are you? <clears throat> FCC ICOMP.C. How could you have returned a bad value here? ICOMP info. ICOMP altitude max comparator deviation. Okay. It's going to be in here. Okay, icom.h. So this guy here, altitude uncorrected. Okay, so we're probably reading some junk there. Is it the tropa where the alt temp stays at minus 56? Yes. Well, I mean, it stays at whatever it hits there. Thing, yeah. The, the tropa pause refers more to the slope rather than the temperature, actually. So, 
Ah, uh, yaps. Once more. But to me slowly. Okay. This guy here. Where are you? See eye comp. Yeah. Okay. 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 So info here is going to be the FCC pointer. So that. So we probably got bunk in there. Bunk data in there. Uh, so it's an FCC T pointer. <laughs> Getting warmer. FCC. Uh, common icom C. Okay, okay, okay. IDE info. And we want to be looking at field. ADC altitude uncorrected. Uh huh. Huh? How about you return about value there? Altitude uncorrected, altitude to pressure. Hmm. Okay, this is the th this is a piece I modified, I believe, didn't I? I didn't. What the hell? I screwed something up. I must have. It checks for make sure that at least nice. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I said it's minus fifty six. Minus fifty six point five, exactly. Celsius. Right, so I probably fucked up the functions here. Feet to meters. P minus that junk. Okay. Did I does it does it already return in feet? What the hell was I thinking here? Get diff. Okay, okay, okay. Try air molar mass. Isotemperature temperature lever per L per meters to feed. Per Alvaro pressure QNH Earth gravity. Iso SL temp K. For what units is this? You know, it should be a ratio anyway. So uh, units don't actually matter. UNH is going to be, it's just, as long as they're the same units, who gives a shit? Um, hmm. What did we return here? I made it go pear-shaped. He died. E zero, Earth gravity. Not the same stuff I use in the other one. Lip ACF fuel source perf dot C. Pressure altitude to pressure, then pressure to altitude. So these need to be exactly inverse of each other, but they should be. These is P zero. Yeah. Okay. Basically, this here equation, P0, 1 minus temperature lapse rate, ISO TLR per 1 meter. Uh, uh. Yeah, so feet to meters. This is just expecting feet, whatever. Um, divide by P0, temperature K to the power of. Earth gravity times the dry air molar mass divided by universal gas constant divided by temperature elapsed rate is exactly this equation which I inverted. How the hell did I end up with a difference there? Ah, and sort of strength. PL21 common, uh, ICOM P utils, no, ICOM.h. This is a common comparator function. Max deviation pressure. 
do 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 Max deviation P hundred as a sea level pressure. So I'm just gonna crash it again. Checking the max deviation is greater than or equal to zero here. So if I just pause or crash the thing here, I can see exactly what sort of pressure it returned. And I could see the altitude, right? Okay. So assert 3F that this is the deviation, right? So we want to make sure that this is greater than or equal to zero. And we're just going to rerun the sim, make it crap itself again. Please compile today. There were tests here. Yeah. Then again, if I, I don't think you'd want to see me sitting here through running a truckload of tests. I mean, it should be probably. This is still something that you guys are going to be relying on for your entertainment, so. Don't want it. Don't want it to be completely broken. Rock and roll, and please crash or die in a fire. Starting up. Yeah, sure, whatever. Do, 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 do. Keep you on. And boom, there we go. Ooh, three or five comparators at the same time crap their pants. So that's fun. Um, so apparently, deviation altitude 50. Okay, so how the hell did we do that? Of course this is going to be higher. Wait a sec. How is this ever supposed to work? He is less than max deviation pressure. Plausible altitude reading. If this is lower, then this has got to be a higher altitude. That means this is the base target. That is crap. And I bad 45 meters no hang on that ain't right source perf gentlemen what the hell did i screw up here a script implementation p over p0 to the power of universal gas constant multiplied by the temperature lapse rate divided by the product of gravity and molar air ma molar mass it's putting in standard gravity i'm going t0 multiplied by all of that crap there Divide by temperature lapse rate. What the hell's going on here? P is greater than zero. T zero is greater than zero. P zero is greater than zero. What the hell's going on here? Ice sea level temperature. T 
can't be a matter of like numerical precision. We got double floating point numbers all over the place here. These should work just fine. Quick check of the math here over GM. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be one minus that to get that. LH over T0. So multiply all of that shit by T0 divide by L. That's going to give you height or altitude. All right, your molar mass. This should be the same thing. P0, Q and H, P0 multiply by. I'm gonna make a mistake here. I see low partial dash stats in Pascals. Almost certain of it. Ah, crap. Save you. I know I did. Divide by TLR. I divide by the TLR. Our function, one minus that. I want to see you run through tests. Yeah. Now that'd be the computer doing the tests. I'd just be sitting here twiddling my thumbs. Feet to meters altitude. Times TLR per one meter. I feel like I did use a correct one. Okay, this needs to be pulled down into a little test program. So usual stuff, make our test. Test C, include ACF utils, curve.h, and main, return zero. Double H is gonna be whatever. Um, double Q, P zero Q and H. It's gonna be one zero one three two five. Um, sure, this will all work. It's altitude and that and meters to feet. Good stuff. So print it. So we'll go double. Pressure is gonna be first converted altitude into pressure. That's standard, so ISO SL press. Altitude is going to be our H value, so go to meter for meters to feet, or yeah, meters to feet is what it needs. And then we go to H out and convert that back. Q and H is ISO SL press, or rather, it's Q and H. Shove that in there. Good stuff, pressure. It's gonna be our altitude and feet, so we're gonna have H in, feet, whatever. H out is that and feet. And the pressure we got along the way should be exactly ISO C level Q and H pressure. So H in. H N meters to feet, H N meters. Well, it's already in feet, so feet to meters, just keep everything consistent. Meters to feet, H out and pressure. Test and test.c and it needs an include location, which is over, uh, where are you? User, no, it's home, next dev. Please don't do that. DL650, plugins, systems, source, lib ACF utils, source. Yeah, okay. Link, home. 
Next step, CL650 plugin systems, source, libacfutils, QMake, LIN64, LACFutils. I need to get rid of that space there. I need some math include and I need some SDDIO include, SDDIO.h. Rock and roll. Test program complete. What the fuck? So if I set this to like a thousand. Uh huh. Huh? Oh, hang on. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, H out is. Yeah, there you go. Okay, the unit conversion is fucked. Hey, look away, and now you're getting a unit test. Hmm. Hmm, <laughs> Oh, what the hell did I screw up here? Lib ACF Futils. I did compile it, didn't I? I think I did. Uh, what the heck? Now it's good? Oh, I know. Uh, probably, I think I know. I might know. I might not have recompiled the library, so it was linking against the old version. But... Wait a sec here. It should be returned in feet. Meters to feet. Yeah. Uh, command for test. See? Yeah, now it matches perfectly. What the hell shit balls? Yes, 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 yes. Screw it. Set off. Okay, uh, not an actual bug. Uh, false alarm. It just had to recompile the library. That's all. Uh, common. Icom. How though? How could we have overlaid the same symbol somehow? Who the hell knows? So, I mean, we could, I can leave the assertion check in there. Okay. Um, false alarm. Well, lesson learned, just keep your builds build in and generally you'll, you'll be okay. And all that is good. We're gonna do a Pancake King here. I'm just gonna go full power on a couple of cold engines. Perfect. Fuel low temp, I know. We're gonna have fun with it. Realign the IRS as quickly. Uh, don't need synthetic vision. I do want the flight path vector though. I want some climb performance. I'm gonna leave you in there, whatever. Just leave me alone, aircraft. And rock and roll. Actually, you want some temperature for, yeah, and some pressure on the hydraulics. There, minus 30 C. And let's go. Take off commands. Let's 
so currently the reference computer just to check the airport reference um or the, the currently the system is computing with a elevation here of what is your elevation 1582 feet and the sim says one five almost eight two feet so i'm i'd say we're close enough for government work uh yeah yeah high high pressure slightly high pressure on the oil seal there but it'll fly Trim, good stuff, rock and roll. Get you up higher. On a flight level change. Make me proud, make. Gonna fly, baby. Climb thrust limit. Engines are pushing. 6,100 pounds of thrust, which in my dumb metric brain is about that many. Okay, so what are we looking for? Altimeters. Altimeter stuff. So X plane says we're at 4888. Altimeter is reading 53. So it's 500 feet high. We're about uh, 4,000, 3,000, no, 4,000 feet off the ground, 500 feet error. Okay, okay. Isa is so super cold. I'm going to sort of mess with the tropopause. I don't know. Let's leave it. I'm just going to leave it in the climb here. Go past the tropopause. Honorable next altitude. I know, thank you. Some lighty lights. Other than that, we're good. So, ISA is decreasing. So we just past 9k x plane says 8k okay so we're a thousand feet low which at isa minus 34 does that match your expectation uh let's see let's look at what the math says math says plus or actually minus 34 and we should be reading 9,000. let's see how no, no, this is True altitude, right? So, x plane says eight. We are actually reading almost a thousand feet higher, or pretty much a thousand feet higher. Yeah, well, it's 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 pretty much there. Just about. Okay, cool. Continue. Old current heading. We got everything retracted. Laps are as much up as they'll go. Good stuff. My data from NAF Canada goes only up to 5,000 feet AG1, but it's about 1,000 feet at minus 34. Yep. That's what we would expect here. 12k i mean so this is there's some spring in us in the numbers 10.7 12k so we're over reading by about 12 oh, 1200 but the iso deviation is coming down so eventually these should re-merge 
when we reach the tropo the tropopause, which in X plane right now, I think we got it set to standard pro standard values, don't we? Feel sit not that one. Sim weather tropo L. Hang on. Hang on. It's set to a wrong altitude. Did I mess that up? Eleven thousand is the tropopause altitude. Minus fifty six point six. Yeah, okay, that's that's close enough. You can see how it's extending the runway center line there. Because I have it's it's still sequencing inhibited on the uh, missed approach point. Do bear in mind though that this computation for the temperature there's a little bit of lag in there, so we are there it does actually simulate things like the sensor having thermal mass and all that good stuff. Uh, let's get rid of all payload. Here we go away. Also gonna get rid of most fuel. I don't need it for this test. Fuel 650 fuel tank. 900 kilos on one side. Airplane's gonna be a little bit unhappy because suddenly it removed a ton of weight. Literally a ton. Actually, uh, you know, this guy needs to go to standard, and this guy needs to go to standard. Good stuff. 20,000. We should be 18, so 2,000 feet high. Nice of deviation is slowly coming down. <laughs> Come on, speed up. I'm accelerated past the thing. Oh crap, I pushed it one too many times. <laughs> Just point the view up here so we get less scenery, higher frame rates. My poor little GTX 970. Cra Holy crap, is the GPU market fucked right now. Every time I think it can get worse, it does get worse. How? Where the hell did those cards go? Okay. So let's stop at 27. 27, and we are at 25. So it's about 2,000 feet holding steady here because of shrinking ISO deviation there. Like they went into consoles. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, 30k. 30k. We are, well, it says 30k. We are actually at 28,300. So it's starting to narrow down because of the fact that the ISO deviation is starting to come down. We are rid of the HUD here. Might help frame rates a little bit. Alrighty, 33,000 minus four at this point only. I'm not sure there's some kind of ransomware attack on the Western US pipeline is royally screwed. Supply places are running out of gas. Ooh. That's not good. Temperature comp page. Yeah, I, I, well, although I'm going to end the stream after this climb here, because I also want to have dinner and stuff and uh, check here 33 and we are only a thousand feet at this point away
Okay, and so here we are coming up to ISA. Maybe drop a pause anyway. We're getting low on the MSL altitude, so we just passed. So here's drop a pause, zero. So why are we reading 500 feet higher? Did I screw something up? What does my computer code say here? It should for ISO zero, so at minus 57 degrees Celsius. Okay, debug time. Uh, go to full view here and debug time. Not that. Here. Uh, okay. Uh, break. Uh, we're going to stop in fizz.c773. Continue. Reload code. Perfect stuff. Position elevation. 35, 44, 3, 4, 4, 6. Sure. Close enough. Oh, hang on. Hmm. Right. It's, yeah, the problem is I'm looking at my reading rather than the Okay, still 500 feet off. Shouldn't we have converged? So temperature wise, we should be at essentially the same thing. So shouldn't they, these two values have converged here? Why are we over reading? Yeah, the standard pressure. Hmm. Well, if I do this now, seven seven seven, it should return. What is our, what is our TS here? Uh, I can't do that in brain numbers. So static temperature is this low? No. Can't be. Minus 273.15. Yeah, okay, so minus 56.5 exactly. Right, convert C to Kelvin. PS is therefore minus 56.1, minus 56.5. So P0 therefore is the exact correct value. So Toto screwed up something with the you're above the trough pause. Is there any issue with altimetry due to difference in lapse rates? I'm not sure. <laughs> but even so, the old equation worked up there. So this one should as well. P0, temperature lapse rate per one meter. Elevation. Zero. Yeah. Wow. We might be differing by gravity. Uh huh. <laughs> no. What's standard gravity? Uh. Point system source. A serials per Earth. Earth. Gravity. Where are you? Yeah, 
a little bit, but I don't think that's going to make enough of a difference here. Although it's a part of an exponent. Mm, mm, probably not. Earth gravity accurate. At our latitude, zero elevation. Started at that number so much it's started at that number. Turn in my brain. Six six five. Uh yeah. So at most T zero. It's slightly off on the expected pause elevation minus iso tlr is there a six time well this zero zero six five es plus that that should what the hell did i did my brain skip a beat or something should be exactly correct. Why the hell is the T zero value so? Well, I know it isn't. Uh, ah, <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, I'm doing some filtering there. Right. I know. I know. I know. I know. Here's a problem essentially. So because I'm trying to. Yeah, you know, so here's the problem. Essentially, I'm climbing so fast that the T0 value for the atmospheric temperature here has not caught up with me yet. It will eventually all come into focus. So, I'll just go ahead and keep on climbing. It will eventually pull together. It's just because of the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm filtering that T0 change from X-Plane. So you don't get like these giant, uh, you know, altimetric errors when, when the simulator so suddenly decides to change pressure or temperature on you. Yeah, now they're perfectly almost in sync. See? So... Come on, airplane, climb up there, ready. Altitude select capture. There we are. Well, now we're actually over or under reading. What is the filtering rate? It's, I think it's right now it's 90, but I can change it. At least to speed up the convergence and get closer to tropo out. No, I, I'm, I'm happy with the convergence here. Now it's a little bit of a deviation because of the fact that we're above tropo altitude and it's, and it's basically assuming a continuation of the lapse rate. Um, so, could we change that? Since we're over, the lapse rate should perhaps Different. Um, just a thought. Well, there'd be a kink in the line there, but I don't remember there being any kind of inflection point on the pressure uh, on the pressure charts. So the question is, is the temperature lapse rate always constant in the altimetric in the altitude barometric altitude equation, or is it not? Right now we're over reading or under reading actually. So we're yeah, we're at 35,500 and uh, yeah. And it's still, well, it's just slightly adjusting because of the filtering rate for the function there. 
90 seconds. Let's make that 60 seconds. A little bit faster. It takes about two minutes to adapt to the new pre uh, to the new temperature close enough world. One for non-zero TLR, one for TLR of zero. So that's the question: Is do I stack them on top? I'm not sure. I know that there are two. That there's two of them. So here's the other one where our lapse rate is zero. Do I just stack one on top of the other when you get to 11 kilometers? I could. Just not sure if I should. <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and implement that then. Okay, so how are these going to be in? Uh, <laughs> here's a prop. Well, now, so that'll be for the actual pressure computation, but that would not be in the altimeter because the altimeter doesn't know the answer. It's trying to compute altitude, but it doesn't know what the output altitude is going to be. So that have to go in here in a physics. That's weird. That would then mean I don't know, maybe. Update. It's part of an update function here somewhere. Where are you? Ah, there we go. Yeah, atmospherics update. <laughs> P0. Q initial P0. Sure. That's for the reference elevation here. And then altitude to pressure barrow. I know your true elevation. Should I just, you know, lice it off wherever the tropopause is for X plane, just stack them one on top of the other? That's what ISA does. Depends if Avionic could try and determine what has crossed the tropopause by tracking OAT or use a stock standard 36 zero or have a way to input into this. Well, the, the Avionics, well, in the Challenger, there is no entry for that. So it might just, yeah, it might just wing it from there. Cool. So it's what I'm going to do. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up here. Thanks for attending, folks. It's been a fun ride. You've had fun. Hopefully, I've had fun. And yeah, from here on out, not an Airbus. Indeed, it isn't. So. I'll see you folks later, and uh, it was fun and informative for my project. Yep, you absolutely did help me along the way. Thanks, Captain Crash. See you, folks. Take care. Have a good one. Love you all.